At this time, I'll call our October Board of Commissioners meeting to order, and I'll ask that you stand for the invocation and the uh, pledge. Uh, Commissioner Langley will do the invocation, and Commissioner Reboats will do the pledge. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we are grateful and thankful that we're able to come together one more time to do the business of your people. Father, guide our thoughts and our steps, Lord, that we will do what's right and pleasing in thy sight concerning your people. We thank you for the opportunity to serve. Be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please face the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And, and to the republic for which, which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I ask that if you have a cell phone or a smartphone to please turn it off or put it in the vibrate message or face a fine of $25. That goes for the commissioners. We're down to item number six, conflict of interest. Uh, is there a commissioner that needs to disclose, disclose any possible conflict of interest? Hearing none, we'll move to the approval of the agenda. Uh, on the approval of the agenda, I'm going to move the school resource officer update to item number two under items for presentation right after uh, Matson does his uh, in order to accommodate the speaker. Is that correct? That's it. Thank you. Okay. Motion to approve. We've got a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of approving the agenda, raise your right hand. Thank you. I. We had no one sign up for public comment. Is there one that would love to speak for three minutes? Hearing no one, uh, is any of our legislators here tonight? Seeing and hearing none. Uh, we're down for items for consent. Uh, I want to pull item number four for discussion by our tax assessor. Um, any other item that needs to be pulled? Can I have a motion to approve the uh, the other eight? eight? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. And a second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Five, two. All right. We're down to items for presentation from the health department. Uh, Jim? As always, it's good to see everybody. Y'all are doing well this evening. So I, I guess 559 days since our first case of COVID. So here we are, still going at it a year and a half later. Um, and so I'm going to present some of the numbers, starting with the state numbers. You can see that um, recent trends are in the good direction. So the numbers have started to go back down statewide. This is, and though I didn't put a, a slide up here, it's also true for the positivity rates uh, in North Carolina and the hospitalization rates are starting to go back down as well. So all good uh, indications that um, that um, that wave of, of the Delta variant has made its way through North Carolina and uh, is uh, starting to go back down. Hopefully it will stay down. Uh, this is the Beaufort County numbers uh, over the last, well, uh, yeah, this one since the beginning. So you can see that we are also showing that decrease in uh, cases in our trends. Uh, just looking at our numbers for right now, so we have had almost 7,000 total cases that we've recorded. And right now there's 394 known cases that we're following. Uh, 15 of those cases are in the hospital, and one of them is on a ventilator. And uh, what we're seeing right now is averaging about 27.9, so almost 28 per day is what we're seeing. And that's down from almost 60 per day, which it was at the peak about a month ago, last time I was here. 
This shows how we compare to the, uh, the state. Um, you can see that we're, we're in the third uh, grouping, so we're right in the middle. We are averaging, or we've shown about uh, 73 cases per 10,000 over the last two weeks. Uh, last uh, month when I was here, that was all dark purple, if y'all remember, so it's, it's good to see this. So, out of, uh, since June 1st, we've had 2,302 cases, and I use June 1st because that's when the Delta variant first came out, and that's when we started to see the numbers increasing again. And so I use that as kind of a starting point for the, the second wave. And uh, out of the 2,302, 89% um, or 2,049 of them are unvaccinated individuals in, in the county. Those are similar numbers that we see uh, from Vidant as far as numbers in the hospital for the vaccination and unvaccinated rate. Uh, just a couple more things to show you, which shows the same trend. This is a COVID-like illness that Vidant does. So in all their emergency departments, they compile who was seen in the emergency department for what they call COVID-like illness. And you can see that those numbers have also started to decrease. And then the impact on the healthcare system, it's still pretty high. If you look at the number of uh, cases that are in the hospital, they're at 172. And the um, ICU and the uh, ventilator numbers are still up a little bit high. So fewer cases, but uh, those that are, there are some more serious ones that are coming up from there. Um, and of course, uh, not only cases are going up, but deaths have gone up as well. So over the last two months, you can see that we've had a uh, spike. We've had about, we've had uh, 21 deaths since the June 1st time frame, and most of those in the last two months. I still have uh, probably three that I'm looking at that will go into September when, uh, if I get the certificates back and, and see that they are COVID related, but I'm pretty sure they will be. Um, but look, using that June 1st time frame, um, I think it was uh, Commissioner Deathridge that asked the question about did the average age go down. And so I didn't have the data then, but I looked at it. And prior to the June uh, time frame, we had 101 case, or 101 deaths, and the average age was 77.1. Since then, the June time frame, we've had 21 deaths, and 67.4 was the average age. So much younger, 10 years younger of occurrences of death. Probably because the older, older folks are the ones that went and got all vaccinated. So we have a high number of vaccinated, vaccination in the elderly population, which is probably partly what's attributing uh, to this. And um, I didn't put it on the slide, but later I thought about this was the mortality rate. So prior to June, 2.2% uh, of our cases uh, ended up with uh, death. And since the June, uh, first time frame, it's 0.9, so it's over half uh, mortality rate has gone down since then. Again, I think it's because the elderly is vaccinated more so. Uh, so testing, uh, we still do a lot of, uh, doing a lot of testing, but testing is starting to go back down. We did 1,007 tests between Vidit and uh, Agave in the health department last week, and the positivity rate is now at 13.3%. That's going down for the last three weeks, three weeks in a row, which is again a good sign of things in the in the county as far as numbers of community transformation or transmission that's occurring. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll next time we'll be down below 10, stay below 10. Um, just to show you that the Delta variant is still the predominant uh, variant in the, uh, in our area. As a matter of fact, 100% of all the cases isolated through the Vinant region have been uh, Delta variants. Um, we are uh, going to, we change up some of our test sites or locations, but we're not changing up. What we've done is we moved from the health department doing tests at the, the building out behind us to uh, Optum doing those tests. And so we got a vendor to come in and do that testing for us. This frees up some of my staff to uh, catch up on some of the work that they've been putting off now for a while, as well as to prepare for the mass vaccination efforts with the boosters that we're planning ahead. So that the Optum will be operating out of that building from 7.30 to 11 every day, every work day. 
And then we're getting a second site that will be at the 810 Hackney Avenue, which is the Temple of Jesus Christ um, Life Center. Uh, I think that's a good location because of where the, the roads are. And they'll be operating from 8 to 5. So they'll be there all day long doing testing. Uh, that will be available there. Uh, what we found is that a lot of the businesses are needing weekly testing, you know, as those guidances are coming down. So uh, we, won't, we would not be able to have done that all through the health department. So that's why we're going to open up the second site. They'll start there October 18th. Uh, and then uh, any transportation issues, BATS will take care of if it's COVID related. So as far as vaccines go, this is showing the uh, number of vaccines. You can see we did have an increase when the Delta variant came about. And uh, it's starting to go back down now. So we're doing right now about 200 first doses a week in Beaufort County. That's um, all sites, regardless. They could have been given, they could have been, uh, given the vaccine in Greenville. And it would still show up on this number here. So um, that's what we're doing weekly. So that puts us right now, and uh, uh, I forgot to mention this. The state recently started receiving some data from the CDC on vaccinations for people that were done in the military, done by the VA, and done out of state. So if they had vaccine in another state, those numbers had not been counted, but now they are. So starting um, late last week. So our, we got a little bit of a boost in these numbers for because of that, about 2% boost in numbers. So right now we are at 52.8% uh, of residents are partially vaccinated. 48.6% uh, are fully vaccinated. For the over 65, you can see 91.1% is partially vaccinated and 87.5% are totally vaccinated. And then when you look at the partially vaccinated in uh, 12 to 17 year age, it's 27.5% and 22% are fully vaccinated. This is how the vaccination, first dose vaccination rate looks compared to the other counties. So we're, uh, we're in a higher level of uh, effort, people vaccinated. We're at 53% or 52.8, 53%. Uh, looking at equity amongst the uh, populations, you can see that the uh, uh, black and African American population is at 47% of their of them vaccinated, and for whites it's 47%. So it's very equ equitable at this point. Suppressed data are your races that are not um, in large numbers in Beaufort County, so they won't they won't separate them out. They won't say like um, American Native American Indians, you know, how many are vaccinated. So they won't give that information. They won't give it for. Um, um, Asian because we don't have a high population. So for some reason, the state suppresses that data. So we have 250 people or so that fall in that suppressed group, and they're behind at 31%. Um, the bottom graph shows the comparison with the Hispanic population, and they're at 43% versus the 48% for the rest are non-Hispanic. Uh, that gap is closing, so we've been working hard trying to get them vaccinated. and. Um, but I don't know if they'll ever equal the right number because a lot of our Hispanic population is younger, and so they're um, they're not eligible to get the vaccine. Um, so some upcoming approvals: the uh, five to eleven year old uh, review has been has been submitted, and the FDA and the uh, ACIP will be looking at that probably in the November time frame, or late October. So it may be available for that age group in the November time frame. Uh, that's about uh, 3,600 or something uh, population that will be uh, opened up. And I expect to see a similar number to the 12 to 17, so probably around 30% of them would probably want to be vaccinated. Um, the booster for Moderna and Johnson & Johnson has been submitted, and they should be reviewed uh, at the end of this month as well. Um, the uh, good thing about, well, I would say this much. One of the, everybody's talking about the booster and the recommendations for the booster, but so far the evidence shows that even after six to eight months uh, with, with Moderna, I'm not sure what the Pfizer number is, there's still still 80% effectiveness at the vaccine. So even though the booster is going to be recommended, you still got pretty good coverage just from the two. 
matter of fact, one shot has decent coverage, which is why we kind of follow that. But uh, we want to try to maximize everybody the, the level of protection that they're receiving. Uh, so uh, for vaccine efforts at the health department, we're still doing it through the drive-through, uh, the, the building behind the health department. Uh, and we can do Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson out of that building. So if you go online to our site, you can uh, register to get the first dose. Uh, the second dose is made at that appointment. And then you can also go on and get the booster or the third dose. Um, uh, I think I got a slide that talks the difference between uh, booster and, and the third dose. Uh, uh, just to put out there, you can also go through the drive through on Thursdays and Fridays through October and get the flu shot if you want that. We are preparing for mass vaccination when the Moderna. If y'all think back, most of our county was vaccinated with Moderna versus the Pfizer. Uh, the, however, if you, the uh, Pfizer recommendation for the booster is out there, so you can now get vaccinated at the health department starting October 13th. So the additional dose versus the booster. When you hear about the additional dose, they used to call that the third dose, but I got confusing, so now they just call it the additional dose. That is for immunocompromised individuals. So somebody that has a weak immune system, uh, and it doesn't mean that your system's weak because you're being elderly or something like that, but it means that you have some kind of health condition, like uh, you're going through cancer treatment, or you have uh, lupus and the medication or something like that. So the CDC has who are considered immunocompromised. So those will get a third shot of um, either the Pfizer or the Moderna as much as one month or 21 days after their uh, second dose. Okay, that completes the series for somebody that's immunocompromised. The booster shot is a recommendation for everybody. Right now, Pfizer is the only one that's been approved for that. Um, and again, you can get that through the health department if you want to or through the Walgreens or any of the pharmacies around can, can offer that. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do expect Moderna and Johnson & Johnson to come out with a booster recommendation as well. Okay. Any questions? Jim, um, the people that have been, that have uh, had COVID, uh, it represents about 15% of the population of both oh, the, uh, the 7,000? Yes. Yes. Okay. Those people don't get counted as in any immunity numbers, do they? No. Despite the fact that people are saying now that those that have gotten it are more, have better immun immunity than the, even the vaccine. Some of those people have, yes. Um, and no, We don't count them because... We don't know whether their what their immunity status is post um, positive. The thing about um, being positive on a COVID test and having a systemic reaction to it. So if I get COVID in my nose, I might be fighting it off in my nose, and, and that's it. I'd never never have a full systemic reaction to that. It just causes runny nose and maybe my eyes, you know. So I don't, I'm not exposed enough for me to have a full immune response to that. Now, if, if I have uh, COVID and I'm in bed for three or four days and I'm really sick, I have built up some kind of a systemic reaction to that. So I think that being positive for COVID versus being sick with COVID disease, you know, having that full-blown uh, sickness causes a, a, a variety of different immunity levels in a person. So I would say that a person that has been tested positive needs to talk to their doctor and maybe they'll get an immunity test and then maybe the doctor can tell them their immunity level is high enough for this. But what, I don't get that kind of data. What's, what's an immunity test? Well, it's where they look for uh, antibodies in your Well, system. I mean, I've got, I've got people I know that have had two vaccines and, and are on the Vitant test daily deal, they got zero antibodies, according to the Viden tests. That, I, don't, I don't know. They're drawing blood? Yeah. yeah. Well, most people... Well, they do the finger, whatever it is that right. Viden does. Most people that have... Most people that have immunity are going to have antibodies. 
whether it's from the vaccine or whether it's from the actual virus. Um, uh, let's go with, uh, since we're talking about um, the antibody test, um, where can you get that where can, for the public's uh, knowledge? Where can you get the uh, antibody test? Biden or where else? Well, yeah, I don't know. Biden, I think, would be the one. Is that the only place? No, I'm sure that urgent care down east can do it. Other places can do it. O'Neill's is doing it. They're all pretty are, so, are, are there different antibody tests or is there just one basic test that's given? And how long does it take to get your um, well, feedback or I'm numbers? Not, I'm not an expert on that test. So I do know that uh, on a call that had a, a virologist on it, he said that the tests are really designed for the vaccine. So I don't know how accurate it is for people that have had COVID. But I imagine that there's tests out there that does show that. I mean, we have them for other things. So if you've had the vaccine, it will pick up some antibodies probably. Right. Okay. Um, is, um, are the vaccinations truly shielding those vaccinated since Delta is the only variant that's killing folks now in Beaufort County? I would think that when I, you look at the data, we're at right at 50% vaccinated as a population. So just using that number, if the vaccine was not working, then you would expect that half our cases that have come since June 1st would be vaccinated and the other half would be unvaccinated. Because if it wasn't working, it would be even numbers. But the fact that it's 10% versus 90%, I think is an indication the vaccine is working. So it's 10, 10 the, the variable is 10 slash 90? In Buffalo County since June 1st, 10% of our cases have been vaccinated and 90%. Okay. 8911 is a real number, but, but just using there's that. Been enough, there's been enough uh, cases that you should, that's a pretty real number, I would think. I, right, I think 2,000 cases over, what, three months or four, yeah. whatever has been is a good indication power, you know. Um, so the, vac again, the vaccine is about 90% effective? No, point. I don't know. that You can interpret it as 90% effective because you have to know how many people were exposed with the vaccine and how many people were exposed who weren't vaccinated. So oh, okay. Not okay, knowing got, that exact got, number. I thought that was just the vaccine vaccinated. It but, was 90-10. But assuming community spread, then I would expect if it did not work, 50% of our cases would be vaccinated, 50% would be unvaccinated. Okay. There's other indications that I think is... Well, that would be too. a 95-5 split, wouldn't it? Kind of, if you using that number. I mean, that... Those numbers. Uh, using no, a 50 50. I'm using just. Actual count. Yeah, I know, but. Maybe, what I'm saying is. He's if, hypothesizing. If 50% of us were vaccinated, 50% yeah. of us are unvaccinated, and something spread through, I would expect half of us to be sick and the other half to be sick as well. So I would just expect 50 50 on the cases. The fact that it's not 50 50, but 90 10 tells me that the vaccination is working. Not 100% because there's still 10% of them that are um, cases. Mm -hmm. So what I was going to say was you saw the mortality rate went down mm -hmm. from 2.2% to 9% or 0.9%. I'm, I'm theorizing that it's because the vaccine in the elderly population has stopped some of those cases. So that to me is evidence that the vaccine is working. Hospitalization rates are very similar. Uh, that 90-10 number, so I would expect it to be 50-50 if it wasn't working. So I think the I think there's a lot of data that's showing that the vaccine works. I've I've got trust in the vaccine from the stats that I've been looking at. Um, uh, is the uh, Biden vaccine mandate to fire unvaccinated healthcare workers affecting Buffer County yet? Uh, okay. So, Mr. Chairman, if I can speak to that, yeah. those are a couple items. Um, so, there, there are two issues related to that. First is the federal OSHA, the, the, the executive order from the federal government relating to 
uh, private employers who have 100 or more employees, there was a vaccine mandate with a testing option, a weekly testing option. Um, that is being uh, put through under federal OSHA rules, um, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Normally, or in, in other states, local governments are not governed by federal OSHA. The relationship that North Carolina has with federal OSHA is that North Carolina enforces those rules under a North Carolina program, but they are required to at least provide whatever level the federal is. They can't be less than what the federal level is. So according to that, so in general, local governments are covered by federal OSHA, but it's done through the state of North Carolina. So we are waiting for the rule that is supposed to come out hopefully in October from federal OSHA as to how that all lays out. And then we will wait for the North Carolina interpretation of that. Um, but if all things are the way they are, as we understand them from what we've read, um, we would be considered in that that group since we have more than 100 employees. Um, so it would require a vaccine mandate with a weekly testing option. The second piece that's come out of the federal government is an executive order that, that, that reads, if you are a provider who receives Medicare funds, you are required to provide a, you're required a vaccine mandate and there is no testing option. You must be vaccinated if you receive Medicare funds. Um, and the assumption there would be that if you don't, then they're going to take away your Medicare funds. Um, now, there are programs that the county administers that receive Medicare funding, DSS, Health Department, EMS. Um, now, there are currently, those rules are still being drafted as well. And we don't know how that applies because you know, as you read the rules, in one sentence it reads facilities and providers and different things. In another sentence it reads something differently. So we don't know until that rule comes down what will be considered providers uh, under that mandate. Um, it took them, I think, six months to get the... Um, original rule out that applied to health care providers. So we don't know when that one's coming out. But those are two uh, federal mandates that, that are on our radar that, that we need to look at. Um, in general, uh, the county employees as a whole uh, are fairly well vaccinated. Uh, very, very pleased with that. Uh, we do have a couple of departments that are not as strong as the rest of the county. And, um, and we're hoping that, that they'll be able to to, to step up a little bit, so that's what I can tell you about those two items. You bet. I'm 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 mostly speaking to uh, like healthcare workers that are private, like Biden. Well, I don't know the status of their. I mean, I know what they put out in the press release that they were required to have it by. Anybody. I can't remember. I don't know if it's been challenged we'll, or. We'll be able to approach that in the, the future. I bet. Right. Okay. And one more question: How many illegal immigrants are getting COVID? And uh, were they vaccinated? I don't, I wouldn't know. I don't ask for their legal status at that time. You don't ask? No. So we're not going to know that? We, we don't, we get an address from them, but I mean, we don't verify any of that. I think it's a grand hypocrisy that uh, we have an open border to the south, south with 20 to 30 percent of the people coming over the border uh, having COVID while the northern border remains closed and while they're going to be firing or fining uh, health care uh, groups who have health care workers who are not vaccinated, who have been around COVID for going on two years now and have built up natural antibodies. I find it a grand hypocrisy. And I'd like to state that. I'm done. Any, any other questions? Uh, talking about the additional and the booster. Okay. Which is better if you've if you've had the Moderna two to get the Pfizer booster or the additional Moderna? The state has said um, to wait for the Moderna that there's not enough um, evidence or uh, studies to show getting the Pfizer after two Modernas is effective. I don't think it's going to hurt anything, but you know the health department we need to follow the guidelines of the state when it comes to the 
recommendations for the vaccinations. So if you receive Moderna, you should receive the Moderna booster. If you receive the Pfizer, you should get the Pfizer booster. Shouldn't mix them. Should not mix them. Okay. I misunderstood you a few minutes ago. Sorry. Thank Any you. other questions? Thank you, Jim. Commissioner Walker. I'm going to speak from the podium because I got some pictures I hope to show you. <laughs> this didn't work too good during rehearsal. So we'll see if it does now. Okay, you know, we're into the school year, and um, with the new SRO um, situation, I thought it important to, you know, touch on that, and some people may not even know what's going on here uh, with the new uh, um, officers that are in the school and the new um, SUVs that are around with Allied uh, Universal on there, so a lot of folks uh, don't maybe not know what that means. I, um, you know, didn't I, having voted for this thing. I, um, my investigation, I didn't go to the superintendent and didn't go to the um, you know board of education chair or anybody and ask my questions because I know they wouldn't sugarcoat it, but I didn't want them to give them a chance. So I went down and talked to teachers. I talked to where the troops are in the mud and uh, everybody. I can't find anybody that is has a bad uh, word to say about this. I'm uh, stalling, but I can't seem to get this to come up. Uh, but anyway, um, they had. Oh, here we go. This. Uh, I'll see if this works. Um, they had sort of a baptism fire the other day with the bomb threat, and uh, I think it did well. Um, slowly but surely, this is, here you go, that's the uh, SUV um, that they, uh, you see at the schools, and they're, um, you know, they park there on the weekends, I think, uh, they don't drive them home. Uh, okay, wait a minute. There's a close-up of the special police on the side. There's a shot of one of the S, uh, SROs playing, uh, you know, he's out there winning the hearts and minds of the, not only the students, but the school staff. Um, there's one at Southside. Um, here he is, uh, you know, a hall monitor. And this is something that wasn't uh, allowed with the original uh, deputies. And uh, I just think this is an important part of um, school security is uh, hall monitoring. And so this is a shot of him monitoring the halls. Uh, another thing was uh, traffic. And I think that's another uh, good thing. Uh, these um, folks, the, the principals, the uh, teachers, everybody who says we call these folks and they come. And before, um, there were days that they were missing uh, or they were out on another, um, you know, call or something. Here it is. He's standing at the door doing fist bumps. So um, I brought in the, um, you know, he's leading this uh, on with uh, Allied Security. I'm going to bring them up. The superintendent's here. And if you have any questions, be, you know, ask them. Um, but like I said, I, my little investigation, uh, this thing's going really well. And uh, so, you know, some good news I'm bringing you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Chief Robert Qualkenbush from Allied Universal Security and also Captain uh, Daryl Hall. And uh, they're going to give you an update here. But I first and foremost want to thank you, uh, Commissioner Walker, for affording, this, for affording us the opportunity to come here this evening. We've just been really excited about the service that we're seeing on our campuses from start to finish, from early sunrise to, to darkness at times. 
And, uh, and as Commissioner Walker has said, uh, tremendous relationships are being built right now, tremendous response to any issues that we're having. Um, but we're just very excited uh, about this professional relationship that we've had, and we look forward to continuing, continuing that over time. So, Chief? Thank you, sir. Gentlemen, my pleasure to, uh, to meet each and every one of you and uh, to be here today and to uh, answer some questions or at least give some information about what we're doing here. My name is Robert Quackenbush. I'm the Chief of Police for Allied Universal Special Police. Um, we're the largest contract special police agency in the state of North Carolina with approximately 173 sworn law enforcement officers servicing 16 different locations across the state, most of those government organizations. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about um, the program here in, in Beaufort County. So we we're happy to say that we are fully staffed here with all 12 physical locations for schools being covered by a school resource officer, including one supervisor who is a floater who fills in on call off sick days, assistance, um, support, and supervision. That would be Captain Darren Hall, um, formerly of the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office, and a school resource officer here in one of the locals. Um, I want to say that officers remain on campus um, during school hours, and training is covered during teacher work days, school breaks, and other breaks, so it's not done during school time periods. Those officers are responsible to the principals and administration staff and the Beaufort County School System as a dedicated resource. Um, summer school and summer sessions will be covered by Allied Universal Special Police Officers, which wasn't previously done uh, prior to us taking over this contract. I want to talk about officers that we've selected here. We want to choose from your local community. So we have eight current officers who either came from the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office or the Washington Police Department. So they were your incumbent officers to begin with. Um, and to include a ninth one who was the former chief of the Aurora Police Department, Mr. Robbie Jones. So he's down at Snowden. He graduated from Snowden and is a school resource officer at that location. Um, of the officers that we have here, on average, each, we have 10 years uh, of law enforcement, government law enforcement experience. So these not, are not inexperienced law enforcement officers. These are, are vetted veteran law enforcement officers that are serving Beaufort County. So these SROs that I'm speaking of were, uh, most of them, or some of them were already working in the schools that they're now assigned to. To include uh, Northside High School, that was the school resource officer for the Sheriff's Office. He is the school resource officer today for that location. Southside's um, school resource officer and baseball coach, he is that school resource officer today, just to name a couple of those. Um, one of the additional services we provide outside of the regular school stuff is the events such as dances and ball games and, and things of that nature. And um, to address the, uh, the, the vehicles, you know, I think that was mentioned a minute ago, those are a flat bill rate no matter how many miles or, or, or wear and tear or whatever it is. So the, the, the county is not paying anything above you know, that certain rate on that one. But we've received a, a tremendous amount of positive feedback. I've personally spoken to uh, many of the principals directly about their school resource officer and what you know how, how those school resource officers were adjusting and providing services and uh, gotten tremendously well received feedback and the fact that officers are out on the pickup and drop off lines helping to open doors and greeting parents and students um, and providing that that interaction um, both inside and outside the school building itself um, the school resource officers are a dedicated resource they have no jurisdiction off property so they do not leave the property they stay on property and they provide that service just to Beaufort County Schools. So uh, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that and, uh, and you know, if you have questions I'd be happy to answer. Any, any commissioner have a question? Commissioner I, don't, I don't have a, a question per se, but the uh, only thing I want to say is uh, I'm sorry you couldn't go on home this afternoon, but we didn't have any doubt that you were not doing what you were getting paid to do. Because one of the things that I can honestly say, if you were not doing what you were supposed to do, we would have heard about that a long time ago. So, and, and, and a lot of your officers that you, that, that you have, I know them and I, and I know their caliber, so I, I, I didn't expect any, anything less. That's all I wanted to say. We encourage feedback from the community, from the commissioners, from the school administration, teachers and parents, so we can better provide a service. And that's what we do. You know, we're very aware that if we're not providing the services we're contracted to, that can be canceled. 
So with that being said, we are very eager to respond to whatever concerns there may be and address them directly and uh, through training and uh, correction, whatever it may be. Comm Commissioner Dethridge. Uh, yeah, in the, in the rare and terrible uh, event that uh, someone who is deranged, who has evil intent, would attack one of the schools, what would be your protocols? The school resource officer is a sworn law enforcement officer who has been trained. So they directly go to the threat. There's no delay. They don't wait on a second officer. They don't wait on backup or assistance. They go and they neutralize that threat and address it. Um, would they call for backup immediately, though? They would call for backup. Yes, sir, they would. Um, they would call for backup, but at the same time, they do not wait. They do not delay and would, address that. Because there's, there's lives of students, faculty, and staff are, are in jeopardy at that point. So the officers committed to those to that response, and they would they would call 911. They would radio Captain Hall, and they would ask for assistance, and they would they would go address it. Excellent. Would uh, officers uh, among your group that are close to that school come for to uh, aid and assistance? If they are in the in a, in a close enough proximity to to render aid, they would be in route. However, state law does say that our, uh, that special police officers, as a general rule, cannot run blue lights and siren in between locations, and that's state law. So they would have to respond via normal traffic. And we would also engage, you know, whatever um, uh, additional law enforcement um, agencies are out there um, to, to assist in that. I mean, at the end of the day, these are, you know, all the, the community's children and, and community members that are staffing those schools. Um, are you suggesting hardened doors whenever possible, uh, interior and exterior? Um, you know, as far as the design of the school system and physical barriers and everything, you know, I think that is the, the best case scenario and practices are what are being suggested at this point. As far as, you know, harden those schools, so uh, locked doorways, um, secure doors, um, entry and exit uh, um, surveillance and or, you know, uh, monitoring, keeping those things locked as much as or at all times, yes, sir. I would, I would think that, uh, you know, if you could create a hallway, uh, event where that would be the kill box for them and it keep them out of the classrooms. I mean, that would probably be the, the best scenario, wouldn't it? it? It would be. However, our officers are going to respond immediately to whatever yep. threat there is there. Thank you. Yes, sir. Other, other questions? Uh, you know, I was doing here was uh, taking time. Nobody takes time to compliment, and I just did. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Commissioner. We appreciate it. I have one question. Does any other commissioner have a question? <clears throat> Last week when you had the event, did you have all the resources that you needed? Um, I, I'll say this. There was a coordinated response between the Washington Police Department, the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office, the State Bureau of Investigation, and our officers that worked very well together to ensure the safety and security of your, your, your faculty, your administration, and your students, your children. Thank you. Yes, sir. If there's no other questions, again, we thank you for being here and have a safe drive back. Thank you, each and every one. We appreciate it. Thanks. The uh, next part in our meeting is the uh, Public Works Director, Christina. First item is the SCAD presentation. SCADA. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I want to <laughs> cut it short. That's okay. I will address that in just a little bit. Uh, while I'm pulling this up, I, I would like to say I believe I may be the only person in the room, but I'm the mother of a daughter who attends the school that was affected this past Wednesday. And as a parent, I would like to express my appreciation to all people involved, from the faculty to the staff, to the, uh, all the law enforcement agencies that, uh, that responded, as well as also to the students in the school. Um, after speaking with some of the staff, um, they, um, the principal uh, said that all of the students took the threat seriously um, and that they responded as they should, and she was very proud of them for doing that. So I'd like to, to say thank you to everyone involved for that. As you can tell, my voice is getting a little emotional. Uh, there were texts back and, back and forth from the students as they are dealing with it and as parents, some of the parents that couldn't reach their kids and that type of thing and other kids. So 
um, for all involved. It, it, it was a very stressful few hours there, so um, I'd like to say thank you again. Um, and now as I'll pull this up. It's on the screen. Um, I was asked to give a presentation to explain exactly what a SCADA system is and how it's utilized in water treatment. So very similar to um, as referencing what uh, Chairman Waters just spoke of, uh, is SCADA. So the, the water treatment industry is like many technical industries. We, use a, our, we have our own jargon and we love acronyms. So SCADA is an acronym that is used um, throughout technical industries and, and I do, I use it just like it's one word and for most people they do not know what a SCADA system is. Uh, but a SCADA system uh, is the acronym for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. So for the past, I would say at least four to five years, we've uh, spoken about the SCADA system at the Beaufort County Water System um, and how it's starting to age out and how we've been investigating um, whether to upgrade or to replace and to how we, what, what we need to do in order to respond. So I've been using that word a lot and again this is just a reminder of exactly what it stands for. Uh, SCADA is a standard term for digital networks and computer systems that gather and analyze real-time data. Again, that can't, sounds very technical. So the SCADA system is essentially a distributed computer system that is used by operations and management for processing and monitoring automation. So again, that still sounds very technical. It's basically the brains behind the water system. Um, it transmits data back and forth um, so that the people that are uh, looking at different systems and maybe are operating those systems, it gives them information so that they can make decisions. Uh, when I'm saying transmitting back and forth, it's a combination of different hardware and different software. And so um, we'll get to that. Uh, the, the data is displayed on a central computer screen that's available to the technicians and the managers. Viewing the data allows the managers to make informed decisions. Again, employees can use the system to control the equipment remotely. And these abilities help water systems to reduce costs, lower risk, and handle operations more efficiently. So that is really the, the heart of the matter. So why do we have a SCADA system? To help us reduce costs, lower risk, and handle operations more efficiently. And again, for those of you that have been on the board, uh, there was a time when Beaufort County Water System did not have a uh, SCADA system that was as detailed as the one that we have now. So now, if this works, I'd like to show you just a brief video that um, kind of puts it in, makes, explains a how SCADA is used in the water treatment process. Now this is more of a schematic video, it's pretty short. Um, our treatment process is not identical, but it helps you to really understand how, the, um, how many components that the SCADA system affects and how important it is to a water treatment system. As you see, it's for small, small bill. So you have the water treatment plant sending out signals to the elevated storage tank. Which then sends it to the well house. Operates and turns the well on. As the water is pulled from the aquifers, it goes through a transmission line back to the plant. And then starts to go through the processes, the actual treatment process from the raw water so that we can get to our what we call finished water. So again, you see SCADA panels all throughout uh, that is operating the pumps and telling, uh, giving direction as far as what's the next process. 
also see how it's monitoring, it's giving information back, the number of gallons per minute. We do not use exactly a gravity filter, we use filters and softeners, so just a little different concept, but still, again, it's taking information, it's injecting, able to measure uh, the amount of chemicals that are injected. This is now sending it to a, what well, we have a clear well, our reservoir is above ground. So then from the clear well, it would then go out to the elevated storage tanks. We have those located throughout the county. Rises to a certain level because that has been predetermined by the SCADA system. So now the water is in the elevated storage tanks that you see throughout the county. So the SCADA system is involved in all of that process until you get your finished water. So again, that helps to understand how vital the SCADA system is throughout the entire process. Now specifically regarding the Beaufort County Water SCADA system, the current system that we're operating on is approximately 16 years old. Our system is very unique. It's a combination of Honeywell, Siemens, and Wonderware. Uh, neither Honeywell nor Siemens offer support services because they are no longer focused on the utility industry. Uh, we actually called in Honeywell and they didn't believe us when we told them that um, a water treatment system had a Honeywell SCADA system until um, Eric Jennings pulled out the information and said, oh no, I was here, this is it, and we found their logos on the manuals that were turned over to us. Honeywell's very heavy in industrial applications, so um, uh, paper manufacturing plants and that type of thing, but not the water system industry. Um, currently, the operating systems that our SCADA is working off of, our servers are server 2003, it's 2021, and client computers are currently operating off of Windows XP. So as everyone is pretty well aware, that's no longer supported. So we haven't been able to do um, upgrades uh, because then we would lose the information. Uh, Wonderware, which is again the third vendor, they are still very much a major player in the market. Wonderware just basically provides the graphics, so that's something that we can still use. Or not still use, but they are still available. Um, our current system is housed on two, was, was housed on two servers for redundancy, an A server and a B server. However, one server is no longer functional. It boots up, but you really can't do a lot or else it'll shut down, so we're currently only operating off of one server which we um, take very good care of. Um, the system was originally operated with three desktop client computers and one laptop computer. Currently only one client computer is still operational and the field staff remotes in through a secure VPN to access the system. Therefore only one field staff can operate the system at a time. Uh, again, we're getting the information. We're able to, um, to turn pumps on and off, but we are at limited capability. Uh, reporting, printing, and notification functions are no longer operational. So the reason that your graphics in your book are a little fuzzy is because of that. Um, the Beaufort County uh, Water SCADA system, again going through it, we have a server located here at our main office. We have client computers. One is at our operation shop on Old Bath Highway in Washington. Uh, one at the Southside Water Treatment Plant, which is located off of Windmill Road and Highway 33 in Chocolinity, and then the Edward Water Treatment Plant, which is located just outside of Aurora. Uh, then we have master SCADA panels, um, and there are 10 locations that are, again, located throughout the county. And then, of course, there are antennas. We're talking about sending information back and forth, back and forth. So um, we do have the antennas um, at all of our other locations. So any location that has um, any type of infrastructure, a pump or a tank, any of those locations, there's something tied to SCADA at that location. So when you're riding around the county um, and you see the little, our little buildings and our little fenced-in areas, that means there's some type of SCADA there. So it's really in every part of the county. Um, I wanted to address the security of our SCADA system because I know that's something that's uh, been in the national news quite a bit. I wanted to let you know that it's 
Our system is operated through a dedicated VPN, which is a virtual private network, and it's a closed network. There's a, a designated tunnel, VPN tunnel for this. So our SCADA system is separate from the county network. It's separate from everything else. Um, EIS has um, made sure that we are, are isolated. There are firewalls that are in place, and of course it's password protected uh, with programs running to detect um, you know, any type of, of fraudulent activity. Um, also very important to note when we're talking about security, Beaufort County Water does not operate the chemical treatment or the chemical injection remotely. So you hear about, uh, I believe it was in Tampa, where someone came in and they were uh, adjusting the injection levels of some of the chemicals. We do not do that. We turn pumps on, we turn pumps off, that type of thing, but we do not actually control the injection of chemicals remotely. So that we actually do in place, and that's something, um, and I'm not saying that we may not ever do that, but our current SCADA system doesn't really allow us to do that. So um, but that is something that, that um, in order to keep it more secure. Um, again, the next few screens are just screenshots of what we have. Again, just showing you this is our current system. Again, you can see that this is a well site. So again, um, we're able to go in and you know turn the well on, turn the well off, and that type of thing remotely without actually having to go send a person in a truck to the well site to turn it on and off. Uh, the treatment plant, again, you see the images which are uh, showing the pumps. So again, being able to operate the pumps remotely. Um, these are some of the actual panels. This is actually in the Southside Water Treatment Plant. So again, you see these are all uh, lights and these panels, which you can't see, but especially that first one is probably at least 12 to 15 inches deep. Um, and these are, are full of the electrical components that are controlling all of those um, toggles and lights and, and dials that you see there. Um, Valve station, again, uh, this is actually slate stone where we're able to um, direct water in one direction or the other direction based upon where it's needed within the system. Next is a booster pump station. Again, we're able to go in and to see what pumps are running. And lastly, you have uh, one of our elevated storage tanks. And again, we have the graphic where we're able to go in and set the levels uh, that the tank should be at um, so that they um, the water turns over because we're always worried about the age of the water and that type of thing. So we're able to monitor that and able to see that remotely um, if if there's a, a large, um, if we get a telephone call from emergency management and there's a large fire and, and this, this happens, this is a real life thing. When they know they're having a large fire that they're going to need an abundance of water, they will call us. Um, and then personnel can go in and turn pumps on so that they're able to, to uh, make sure that they have adequate water in that area. Uh, again, and this is in your uh, agenda books, but again, the existing system components are no longer available. Technicians have been patching equipment and utilizing workarounds. Uh, staff investigated and spoke with three different engineering firms regarding the upgrade of the existing SCADA system. Staff also spoke with various water systems to discuss how they have upgraded their systems. Custom Controls Unlimited from Gardner, excuse me, Gardner, North Carolina was highly recommended. Uh, this company is a comprehensive systems integrator. This is what they do. They provide on-site troubleshooting um, all the way to engineering full-scale turnkey integrated systems. That sentence came from their website, but um, CCU has visited Beaufort County many times, worked with staff, and has prepared various options for upgrades or equipment upgrades. Um, you, again, we looked at what it would take to band-aid the system, what it would take to, to um, totally put in a new system, whether it should be a phased operation. Again, you know that I've spoken about this for many years, so we've evaluated many different options. Um, and Custom Controls has assisted us with that in the, uh, the last year or so. Um, one other thing to note, and I put this down at the bottom because I actually read this in an email and industry update this morning, which is that during a webinar on cybersecurity on September 22nd, uh, EPA's Director of Water Security Division, David Travers, explained that the EPA could have a new cybersecurity regulation for all water 
utilities in a matter of months. So uh, because of all of the national news and the uh, things that you've heard about, we are expecting EPA to come out with some type of new regulation, and we haven't really had that previously. So um, I definitely would like to, uh, like to recommend that we uh, move forward with um, modernizing our SCADA system. And again, uh, the staff's recommendation is basically that, which is that we approve the replacement of Beaufort County Water Department SCADA system. The approximate cost that we're looking at right now is $700,000. Uh, that would be the full uh, replacement cost of the new system. Again, we have looked at uh, doing it in phases or doing it partial, um, but it appears that this would be this would be in the best interest if the funds are available. Um, we spoke about if you recall when we spoke about this during the budget season, uh, we said that we would come back and look at the possible funding, uh, how we would fund that, uh, whether we would put that out. Um, excuse me, I've got things going here. Um, whether this would be something that we would finance or uh, that decision would be made at a later date. So. Uh, that's my skater presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Commissioner Booth. You stated that these, these, this system was obsolete. Yes, sir. And you also stated that a band-aid band approach. If the parts and stuff is obsolete, how do you, how do you anticipate keeping this, this uh, system up? If you can't get parts. I really don't. <laughs> it wouldn't be it. We have band-aided and band-aided for the past uh, many months um, okay. into the years, but we've reached the point now, especially uh, the, the radios are definitely obsolete, so we'd have to go in and replace. Previously, we could, if one radio goes out, we would go in and replace that one radio. We're at the point now that if a radio goes out, we're probably going to have to switch numerous radios. So then we would be buying new radios for an old system. Is this, is this system monitored 24 hours a day? It is not monitored by a person 24 hours a day, but it operates 24 hours okay. a day. What, what does it do besides tell water where to go? What else does it do? Uh, it gives us information. Does it do it mix information about your chlorine or whatever? It, we do not have any sensors that it's reading that it's hooked up to. Um, the, a new, again, our existing SCADA system only tells water where to go. Okay. That's basically it. Um, but, and the SCADA in the plant does do some monitoring and that type of thing. Um, but out in the distribution system, it does not. A new SCADA system would have, we would be able to do that. Uh, when we installed the new generators, mm -hmm. our existing SCADA system, we could not put the operation of the generators on the SCADA system uh, so that we would know when they're running. But what we did is we left um, uh, the 5 milliamp signal space in the generator so that when we get a upgraded SCADA system, would we would be able to go back and monitor that. Because right now, if we have a power failure, we have to put a person in a truck and drive them to see if the generator is operating. Uh, with the new system, that would be one of the points that it would get information from. And so then we would be able, if we have a person sitting in the water treatment plant, uh, you know, pulling... 24-hour duty, he would be able to look at it and say, okay, I know the power went out, but I know the generator's on. And so we'd have that information. If the system went totally down, how, what, what effect would it have on the county residents that, that rely, rely on our water? My hope is that the residents would not realize an issue. However, it would have a great effect on the water department personnel because they would be physically driving to every every um, location to turn pumps on and turn pumps off. So it would not be something that we would be able to sustain for a very long time. And how many years have you been asking for this system? We've been talking about it. It's been on the capital improvement plan and we're getting down to it. So, been planned. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Walker. Um, the company you mentioned that will be providing the new SCADA system did he? Did you choose them by bid? Did they bid on them? I, I didn't say that they would. I said that's who's been working with us. Um, we have not put out a formal RFP, um, but 
due to SCADA, there is, because of the technical nature of SCADA, we can actually make selections based upon what they do, but we would um, issue a formal RFP and they would respond. They do have, en they have engineering as well as um, the manufacturing and the installation, so it's more of a design build. The new SCADA system, would it reduce personnel? Could it reduce personnel? No, not our existing personnel, no, sir. But it may delay hiring a new. The, uh, I do understand that your ballpark is $700,000 will replace the system totally with a new system. Yes, sir. Okay, is it going to be necessary for a new system to be hooked into the Internet? Or will it still be an independent freestanding system? Okay. Now, I'm not the most technical savvy when it comes to the Internet, but what, so what you determine as Internet, I'm not 100% sure, but the SCADA transmits data from the, the most far out places via radios. And Eric, please correct me if I say this incorrectly. So that goes via radio back to what we call the masters. And then from the masters, that is where DSL or internet, it transmits from those locations to the main servers here in the office. So there is access to the internet involved in the systems because that gets the information from places because of the large geography of this county we do not send everything via radio. Uh, we say internet but would it be possible, could it be just telephone lines as opposed to having to use the internet? Not, no because telephone lines don't transmit data. Correct? I mean, they would just do the voice. But it's DSL, it's just, um, so, and it's not out to the public internet. Again, it's through that VPN and that dedicated. Well, that's what I was getting at. Still a mm -hmm. private network. Yes sir. yes, sir. And we could build firewalls and other protections into it to make sure that nobody ever crossed it over. Absolutely. Actually, the quote that's provided to us was including, um, I forget how many firewalls, but it was more than enough. But yeah, absolutely firewalls would still be included. Again, so the security of it would be very, would be built into it. The short and simple answer is you're not going to get away from internet. Yeah. You're going to have to use the internet at we some point. We don't want to as we're trying to move forward. That's right. You, it, we used, before we had the skate system that we have now, we actually used telephone lines. And it was, you know, that was the old analog version of it. You know, if you want to know how much water was in your tank, you had a big panel that had a needle gauge that used a telephone signal to te give you like a, you know, 37. That was it. You know, so when we upgraded to this system, those panels went away. So we use internet now through DSL broadband, static IP addresses with VPN on both ends, and it creates a tunnel to make that information secure as it goes across the net. And that's pretty much what you'd have to do with any system that you got from now. <laughs> this this question may be for you, Christina, or Anita. The local government commission, when they sent us a letter concerning the stress analysis, the financial stress analysis, uh, is there any component in there as it relates to? capital and upgrading um, no. that this would help our score? No, sir. It's not? Okay. One more. One more. I, I, you know, this, this, if I understand it, this thing can be paid for with ARPA funds. And I think the board should con seriously consider using some of those funds to pay for this system and uh, because it is infrastructure. Is that not correct, Mr. Manager? And I'll say amen. Would you, would you like to make a motion since you... Well, I'll make a motion that we allocate $700,000 uh, to replace the SCADA system, that we go out for bids, and that we begin this work immediately. I'll second, second. that motion. I wanted to second that. <laughs> any, any discussion? Excuse yeah. me, Randy. I'll yeah. let you do the next. Uh, would, would you uh, revise your Would you revise your motion to up to seven hundred thousand? 
because well, we don't know what the beds are going to be. I know, but that's a that's a budget number. Seven hundred thousand is a budget number. We're allocating. That's what we're doing up to that. We're not guaranteeing we're going to spend that amount of money. We're saying, you know, that's that's the budget number. Okay. Any any other questions, comments before we take a vote? All those in favor, raise your right hand. I think that was unanimous. I think we'll say hallelujah. Huh? <laughs> Good selling. Just wait till you come. Wait till you come back with the price, Christine. <laughs> you know what Ed's question will be. Oh yes, change orders. Yes. He's already you, told me no change orders before we've even gotten started. You want to go to your next item? Yes, sir. Thank you, Eric. Yes, sir. The next item is during the September 7th Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, potential waterline extensions to serve residential areas were presented and discussed as part of the potential ARPA funded projects. Um, the Board of Commissioners voted to reprioritize the waterline extensions serving residential communities. Uh, they moved from number nine and number 10 up to number four and number five. So the chart that's included in your agenda packet shows that revised chart for you. The Board of Commissioners also requested additional information regarding the project. So what you have included in your agenda packet is more information uh, for each of those uh, items listed. Uh, number one, SCADA system. I think we'll talk about that. We'll skip that one. Um, items number two, uh, it lists uh, information about directional drills on Highway 99. It uh, gives the also a small map that shows that location. No, item number three speaks to the elevated storage tank mixers that uh, we were proposing for at $28,000 each. It gives a summary of those, um, how they help to improve water quality and protect the condition of the tanks. Item number four goes uh, into detail for each of the individual locations that were listed in the summary. You'll see a a diagram or a, a aerial photograph that shows the extensions. Uh, this information was taken off of the county GIS, so also the yellow lines that you see in the photographs represent the parcel lines that. So you're able to see the individual uh, parcels that would be affected as well as the existing households that are currently there. Uh, then skipping to item number five, which is the waterline extensions uh, that have not previously been designed. Again, that same information is given to you uh, that shows the uh, aerial photographs and the aerial locations. Then going to number seven, uh, discusses the issues at various railroad crossings, uh, the Old County Road, uh, and also a crossing south of Chacoinity. Item number eight, again, references the storage tank mixers. They are uh, the additional tanks. Uh, number nine and number 10 are kind of uh, lumped together. Again, those are the new water main extensions that would provide uh, loops on the south side of the river. And again, there's an aerial map that shows where those uh, locations would be uh, connecting Carrow Road and Bar Road and then connecting Pollard Road and Caton Road. Any questions regarding that information? Sir? Chairman. Yes. Well, I'll start the discussion with item number five. I think probably eliminating things that are just not justifiable may be the best way to work back to, to what, what we really want. Uh, item number five is new water extensions, Windsong, Windsong 2, Friedman Drive, Cradle Drive, Mordecai, Ashton, Toppin Road, Lovick, and Sam Grady Road. I'm familiar with all of these places. Uh, I did my own analysis this weekend and came to the same conclusion that this spreadsheet has. And that is when you look at the cost per additional meter of these things, it's, it is hard to justify uh, uh, doing these particular projects. Uh, now, uh, Swan Point Mobile Home Park happens to be in here in both places. But with the exception of that, I would keep that in item number four, 
uh, but I would I would say that item number the items in item number five are not economically justifiable because we're talking about anywhere from five thousand dollars per meter to twenty thousand dollars thirty two thousand dollars per meter is just not justifiable when you're collecting thirty five dollars a month three hundred sixty dollars a year year. Uh, for this, it, it takes, I uh, believe they got the payout years in here, the paybacks in this thing are 21 years, 35 years, and when you put interest burden on it, uh, which is not on this, then those payouts become astronomical. So I, I think we ought to just take out item number five. I, I, I put together the spreadsheet and shared it with Christina this afternoon. Um, you know, a couple of things you need to keep in mind is that, you know, even those like the Swan Point Mobile Home where you've got 40 customers, uh, there's not a requirement that they go with our system if we put it in. I mean, they already have existing water. Legally, can if we put it in, can we require those 40 customers to go with our system? Swan Point Mobile Home Park is a different scenario than the other ones that are listed in okay. that that is currently a private water system and um, the owner of that private water system um, would discontinue the use of their private well. Okay. So those residents basically... Here, here again, when you look at the payback, it's based on $48 a month, average bill of 48 mm. That's, I mean... But we bring to the bottom line less than 5%. Less than 5%. Uh, so if you looked at that, I mean, that would increase the payback even on the one at eight years, just 20 times that. Um, well, the one, the Swan Point is different, I think, as Christina said. That person happens to be a client of mine, so I'm, I'm defending my client. And that is, he built a water system of his own. Uh, he tried to give it over to the county. The county refused to take it, saying that it was not modern, it was out of date, and all that sort of thing. So a contract was entered into whereby we agreed that the county would participate with him in certain ways that I'm not even familiar with, and he would ultimately build this out and give it to the county. So that's the only one that's in there, that, that uh, only subdivision that's in there that has some justification for being different from the rest of these. Uh, and, and the county has already taken over a lot of meters from him. So we've got, we're getting revenue right now, uh, a lot more revenue than the numbers that are here. So when you, when you round that out, uh, it's, it's a design system, it's ready to go. That's well, the, the purpose of doing this was to see if there was any on here, and that's the only one that makes sense. Yes, I that's agree. That's the only one that that's makes sense. That's the only one that makes sense. That's correct. Based, I agree. Based on, the, uh, based on the payback. And here again, I want to make sure that's based on gross billing. Yeah, it's not I, based I, on net. I did, I did my work this weekend, and if you, if you put an interest burden on it, as I say, these numbers that, that are on your sheet go astronomical. <laughs> and, and I took our budget number that we passed. It was a little over $8 million divided by 14,000 meters. That may be... That 14 may be a little off. It is. It's a little low. We actually have more. It's a little low. Okay. At least 14,750, I think, is the last okay. number I Okay. Did, did you? Yes. Uh, 14,750. My, my question is, is for staff. We, with uh, what we've done with broadband, and then with what we are do, voted to do tonight with the skater system, where, what kind of money is left? 9.2 minus 4.7. And that, but that's not all. Yeah, that's not lump sum. What? That's that's remaining undedicated money. What? What are the things I think we need to keep in mind with our is our also our general fund balance when we get the audited numbers on there. Uh, in our discussion, we talked about the 35 percent gold, and we talked about anything above that. Uh, you know, allocating it for some capital purpose. Um, I, I I think as we keep discussing these different projects that we've got the possibility of doing general fund. For example, what we just talked about, the 700, that qualifies. 
I mean, we, we couldn't we, use general fund to do that? Well, you wouldn't want to because you would be using general fund dollars for an enterprise fund. So you really wouldn't want to do that. You could. You could loan it to the well, enterprise I, fund. I don't have any problems but, loaning it but, to them. But we'd, we'd rather keep those funds separate. Okay. But it also qualifies for bank financing. But what I'm leading up to is, you know, when you look at solid waste and all the things that, that are important on the infrastructure, we can address a lot of things. It's a matter, really, of whether we finance it with a loan from the general fund, whether we do bank financing, or whether we use ARP money that we can tackle. I'd rather spend Uncle Joe's money first. That's right. It's our money. <laughs> yes, Commissioner B. It's, it's, it's a little bit obvious. We talk about spending our money. We got a, right. we got a program, Christina. That's right. That we paint our water towers. It's on a on a rolling scale. Yes, sir. Does and to the staff does our money qualify? That's not a, considered the infrastructure. Sir, well, okay. tell me the question um, again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, that that generally would not be. I mean, that's more of a maintenance fund. So we, we would generally. I mean, in general, we've set aside funds to do those things on our own. The whole idea about ARP funding was to try to do things that were forward-looking and to not um, take the burden off of an in, uh, uh, off the county or some provider that should be doing the things they should be doing. We ought to be looking after our own infrastructure to begin with. We should be funding that appropriately. If not, if you use money to do that, you're simply bailing yourself out and pushing it down the line. And so you structurally got to fix that first. Well, the reason, the reason I asked after the meeting we set in last week, I don't know how in the heck we're going to spend that money. <laughs> the, to, well, to speak to that, you know, we obviously could. There's, there's, there's lots of opportunities to do that. Um, just two things for you. you. You do have to be careful uh, in the last in the meeting we had last week with the folks on, on ARPA. Um, you can't spend infrastructure money on a if you build it, they will come basis. So you couldn't run a line out to a vacant industrial park and say, if we put water out there, someone will locate. ARPA says you really can't do that. There's got to be somebody on the end. And then I would play devil's advocate for the board in that if you look at the cost of our water system when we first put it in, if you looked at the return on that, you might not have ever put that water system in either. Are you is is the board interested in go ahead and adding this one one development and the cost into the ARP funded? Uh, I would I, what what I what I, what I'm saying right now is number five is not justifiable. I'm I move that we take number five off the list and not consider it at all. And then we can whittle on some other things. And I don't yes, I think we should do what you said there because we've made the agreement with that individual, but I don't think number five is viable at all, so let's take it off the table. Let me ask you, could I ask the question? Yes. yes. Now, now, uh, the people on the south side are asking for the same thing, aren't they? Am I correct? Well, you've got people in subdivisions down there that are asking for things, but take... But, but what I'm saying is they're asking for the same to get the yeah, but in the lines of their subdivision. $32,000 per customer per meter in wind song. Yeah. That, see, that's that's what we're talking about. Just because people are asking for it what? doesn't mean they get it. What? It's got to be justifiable. Well, who, I understand what you're saying, but just because it's your client don't mean I can't ask the question. I don't know what my client has well, got you to do one, with what you you're asking. Saying it. You're making this into a personality I'm not thing. Making it into a personality you need to back thing. up. We'll we come need, back to, we need to start talking about no, the but, finances that are involved I'm, here. But what I'm saying is, if it's good, if they need to be looked after too. That's what I'm saying. Well, you just heard the chairman say that the only thing that was even justifiable, and he's on both of these lists, he's on number four and he's on number five, is the Swan Point Mobile Home Park. That was the only thing in there that's justifiable. He's correct in that. And I, and I understand that. But what I'm also saying that these people ask for some of this public money, too. That's what I'm saying. What, what I'm saying, Mr. Commissioner, is just because they ask for it, doesn't mean that their investment is justified. The people at Winsong were in here. Uh, we listened to them. It's thirty-two thousand dollars per meter to put water into that. It will take fifty-six years 
to break even just on cash, that does not include the interest burden. If you put the interest burden on it, it would probably take 200 years. Or more. And I understand, but we could, could we pass that on to them, some of it? Well, I don't mind if they want to enter into joint. Well, well, well let, wait, let, listen, listen. There are developers. There are people who come in and say we're willing to fund part of this if the county will fund part of it. I will listen to them. I don't have a bit of problem with that because that goes on all the time. And but to justify it based on economics of item number five, there are no economics in item number five except the Swan Point project. That's the only economics that are in there that are justifiable. I, I'm, I'm going to make a motion we move on Swan Point Mobile Park to 187000 And I'll second using that. Using ARP money. I'll second. All right. Now, any discussion? Further discussion? All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I thought we had this long list of stuff that we were going to consider in total and then make the decisions on this. Well, we've already we've already done the broadband, and we've already done the 700. So well, that was post-broadband. The, the things that really stick out like this does on the spreadsheet, I mean, I well, see no reason for us not to not to make a move on it. it well, to at least to give it to staff for planning purposes. Well, I, I, here's what your problem is, though, of not moving on this stuff, is we have a time limit that we have to have this done. And the manager has cautioned us when we started this that if we didn't get on our horse and start riding, we're not going to get there. So the projects that we know that are fully justifiable, we need to go ahead and fund, like the SCADA system, which we've already done, so that... The, the, it can get started so the money can be spent. It's a matter now of how fast we can spend money. For me, it's low-hanging fruit. Okay, we've got a motion. So any other comments, questions? All right, we're going to call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Okay. Did you get that, Katie? All right. Now, can I say something? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I, I still, and like, like Commissioner Richard said, if these, if these people in on the south side that need badly need this water, they can come up with some type of form, I mean, to help out. I don't think we should omit them. They are citizens of this this county. If you can, if we can come up, would you, would you consider putting some money back in? in for oh them? yeah, I would. I, I, I said that I would. If they're willing to fund part of it, we'll take a look at it and see what we can do. Well, well you see here again, this spreadsheet says that in, uh, let's see, Winsog 2, we have two, there's two existing homeowners with a deep well. With a deep well. And when you look at that, it's 96,000. The potential that Hood talked about is only six customers, and that's $32,000. I'm in agreement with him. If if they want if if that subdivision and developer wants to pay part of the money, I think we should consider that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with you too. I mean, I'm, when they put I mean, the, when they put the uh, the numbers out there, but what I'm saying is, everybody that, this this art money is for everybody in this county. I mean, we can't save thirty two thousand dollars for this person and forty two for that. I mean, they're citizens of this county too. If they de if they deserve water just like everybody else deserves water. No, not a, no. It has to be based on economics. Yeah. You, well, you cannot. We're basing it on economics. Yeah, it yeah, has to be based on. Economics. But the decision we just made on on the uh, on the system, gentlemen, was only fifty dollar. The investment was only fifty dollars per meter. And, and when only you, fifty. And when you said fifty dollars per meter, I wasn't going to vote for it. Start with when you said fifty dollars per meter, I came to the conclusion that I was going to vote for it. But now we'll do the same thing, and I wish you would do the same thing if we could do something to help these people on the south side. Hit your mic so you... Well, but they need to make the presentation to us. It's not up to us to go to them. Well, I, here again, I don't think... I don't think that everything's still off the table. All we're doing is moving the things forward that we, are, that we agree on. Yeah. Right? That we can agree Yeah. I mean, I think we're all open to taking a look at the other ones that are on there. Yes. I've uh, been a commissioner a long time, and uh, in the past, the math always mattered. I mean, we've gotten to the point where now where the math doesn't matter anymore. It's just numbers. So, uh, 
I submit to you that eventually the map's going to matter again if there's any money at all left after this debacle that's going on for the last nine, ten months. So uh, we're going to have to make better decisions as commissioners and hope that other politicians above us make better decisions going forward. This was a good decision. Well, yes. Well, I, I know we finished with this item, but what about, I mean, we've done so far uh, item one and we've gone in item four. What about two and three? The uh, directional drills on Highway 99, elevated storage tanks, mixers. The, the floor is open for a motion. Well, I, I make a motion to approve both of those. Number two and number three. Mm -hmm. Oh. Let me let me weigh in on those just a minute. That number two is a hot button item with me because it's something that needs to be done. Uh, it's we're gonna we're gonna have to pay it sooner or later. If you can have a you can have a disaster somewhere where a leg gets cut off on the water system and all of a sudden you can have 200 people without water, we need we need to fix those things. Uh, I'm not so much on elevated storage tank mixers, but. For the amount of money, because I don't think they're needed, but for the amount of money that's involved in it, in order to get the directional drills, you know, I don't have a problem supporting it. Um, the, I think the motion's been made. All right. Second. And we got a second. I was going to give it a chest. <laughs> no, I'm not going to second it. Okay. Half of it I don't okay. support, but I'm going to vote for it. All right, gentlemen. <laughs> Comments, questions from anyone? All right. Now, let's be sure that we're authorizing the water department to proceed with the spending of the money. We're not just putting something on a list. Yeah, do what you need to do. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, yes, sir. How many customers will that impact? The dir directional drills. Well, everybody on that side of the river. I was asking her. Well, I happen to design water systems, I so I know the answer as well as she really does. I really don't know the, the number of customers. Uh, again, if you look at the uh, map that's showing, uh, the, the one of the drills, which is the repair drill, that affects everyone uh, from south of um, Pungo Shores Road down to CB Marina and Foreman Lane. So I would estimate down Foreman Lane's a pretty busy, I would say that's probably 50 or so customers. Um, and then the the crossing over um, Pungo Creek, that's actually currently a division line between Districts 4 and District 5. So we need to work with um, the engineering as far as how that affects the booster pump stations and how we'll be able to utilize that. But again, that would provide additional um, pressure and flow and redundancy. I would say 500 or so. Um, it's, it's really difficult to put a number on in the area because it, the people around Area 4, just on the south side of Pungo Creek, that gives uh, them an additional feed if there were to be a water main break further down. And on the north side of Pungo Creek, Pungo Creek it gives them an additional feed uh, basically from Bell Haven down to Pungo Creek. So it's all interconnected. Yes, yes sir. That's the question, Mr. Chairman. Yes. These, these items that we're discussing in here are things that exist that have been, been valved off. One of them is. One of them is. One of them okay. is. The repair is. Gotcha. Yes, sir. The other would be a, a, new, a new crossing. So these are all redundant systems we're talking about, providing redundancy. No. The first one is not. The, well... Depends on how you want to find redundant, redundant. Well, it was to one provide... is, is putting it back as it was originally designed because right. there was an issue. Uh, the second one would be redundancy and increasing pressure. Uh, again, how did I word it? Um, increasing pressure, increasing uh, or decreasing water age, and redundancy. All right. All those in favor of moving forward with items number two and item three, uh, the first one, the directional drills on Highway 99 and the elevated storage tank measure. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Mm -hmm. Those opposed? Okay. 
Yes, sir. Without, it ain't this, you can answer this, honey. Don't, don't fa- pass out. You can answer. <laughs> the way we're spending all this money, we got to have these jobs done by 2024. How are you going to prioritize? <laughs> that is a legitimate concern, and that's something I went to a, a it border it industry and throughout the state and throughout the country because it's finding engineers available to make the design, engineers to do the design, uh, the permitting agencies, the regulatory agencies have to staff up so that they can review the permits and do that. And then we all know the state of contractors and getting materials in, so it will be a challenge. And Mr. Manager, if, if these projects are not done at this deadline, according to what they told us last week, do we really have to send that money back? Well, that, they, would, they would have to be completed by 2026. They have to be obligated by 2024, which is not a year essentially obligating them. Um, 2026, I think you can get them done. And, and uh, my guess is that because this is a nationwide issue, that I, I would be very surprised if the funding agencies or the federal government didn't push that date a little bit once they get the magnitude of what they've asked the country to do. Mr. Chairman, yes. Go go to items six and seven. Both of those are close to my heart. Upgrades to existing system, various residential areas with small lines, and number seven is issues at railroad crossings. Issues at railroad crossings can be uh, big deals on occasion, and you need to get them while you can because the railroads can be just as bureaucratic as anybody else. Amen. So I would I would motion that we approve items six and seven. Okay, we have a motion for six and seven. Is there a second? Second. All right, we have a second. Discussion? All those in favor of six and seven, uh, the railway crossing and the upgrades to the existing system, residential areas, uh, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Thank you. We're going to take a break. Unless you got, have you got anything I else? I do. Only one small item. Um, item number four, the Roe Avenue. Uh, that particular project, just for further information, if it comes back up again, uh, there's been some discussion made. Um, I've spoken with the resident there, and that may have been previously approved by a previous board. We're still trying to get documentation on that. It would have been done many years ago. So again, I just wanted to let you know that that is a little different. Um, so we are investigating that, but just full disclosure that that, that project is a little different from the others. But we will, um, we're investigating that to see if we can get additional information, and I would bring that back to the um, Water Committee. Thank you. We'll, we'll take a 15-minute break. Okay, we're back. We're down to uh, the Finance Department. Anita? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, right quick on the ARPA funds, I ran the numbers, and we actually started closer with $9.1 million instead of nine point two, as I recall from memory. And so after deducting $4 million for broadband and all the water projects we just... Um, talked about, and also the $1.5 million for the multi-purpose building, we're down to right at $2 million remaining. So, and I'll, I'll put a spreadsheet together on that, that we can keep a running tally going. Um, so, you have in front of you for the finance presentation three sets of papers. Um, the first one I'd like to start with has the legal paper attached to it there. That's the general fund. And the front page there is a TR-401G collection report. And what this report is, is a tax billing and collection report from our tax software, Farragut. And so you might recall us um, saying several weeks back, about six weeks ago, that the tax bills were going to be mailed. And they were mailed the second week of August. And this report shows us the um, billing amount, which is highlighted there, that net levy column. So our net levy billed amount is the $33.971 million for the 2021 levy. And this excludes motor vehicles, by the way. And so when we multiply that number of our actual billed accounts times our collection rate of 98.22%, we come up with an estimated collection rate of the $33.366 million 
for the fiscal year. And if you flip over to the next page, of course, we're interested to know how does that compare with what we budgeted. We want to make sure that we budget, um, you know, closely because the Avalorum taxes do make up 63% of our revenues, which support all of our um, general fund operations. So when we look at that, we you can see that we budgeted for the 2021 levy 33.75 million. I just told you I expect it to come in at 33.366. So we've got a slight variance. I say slight because when you talk about a 383,000 um, dollar difference on 33 million, you know it's right at one percent. So pretty close there, but it's a little less. It anticipated coming a little less than what was budgeted. But on the motor vehicle side, we budgeted the $3.25 million. I'm expecting that to come in at least $3.5 million. So we'll make up most of that um, deficit on the, the real and personal property with the motor vehicles. And so we're really close on our budgeting. So I expect we'll be fine there um, as far as the Avalorum taxes go, um, budget to actual for the year. Next page is a look at sales tax distributions. Um, we just received the information on the July sales. Remember, there's a three-month lag. So the July sales were the second highest uh, distribution that we've ever received. They're $1.1 million. And you can see our highest distribution was actually the month before. The June distribution was $1,130,000. And the state, um, the entire state saw a huge increase in sales tax for July. Um, the association, their report said statewide there was a 17% increase in the July sales tax compared to July 2020 a year ago. And when you look at um, our increase, we so we're looking at the 1920 column, that July number of 804,000, oh, excuse me, uh, the the 973,000 number, um, we had even more than an 18% increase there. So still um, doing better than what even the state is experiencing. And then below there you can see um, the number, you know, it's the first distribution of the new year, so you just see the dot there, the 1.1 million, and of course we'll be graphing that as we move along. Um, during the year there. So any questions on Avalorum taxes or sales tax before we move on to the expenditure side? Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. $25. No, that was, that was the 15 minutes. Oh, okay. That was, 15 minutes. That was the break. $25. It didn't ring. That was an alarm. There's a difference. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> All right, so moving on to the expenditures for general fund on page three and four there. Um, so we're three months into the fiscal year now, so we would expect um, being one fourth of the way into the year, we'd be at about 25 percent spent on the expenditure side. And of course, you know, it varies for each department, but overall, you can see on the last page, we're right at 25%, 24.9% spent there on the expenditure side. So, you know, just in re quick review there, everything looks good, everything looks reasonable there on the general fund. Any questions before we move on? Okay. Next, you'll see um, your next stack there is for the Beaufort County Water District. So first, we have our revenues on the front page there. And of course, our biggest revenue for the water districts are our sales. I have those highlighted there. Um, we're budgeted at $7.56 million. We've collected the $1.266. And if you go over to the right, that's only 16.8%, which you would expect um, to be closer to 25% with us being three months into the year. But we remember we're a month behind in our billing. So um, actually we've, billed, uh, we've only collected for two months, which would be the 16%. So we're right on target there for our sales. Um, on the expense side, moving on to the next few pages there. Um, this is the line item detail for the expenditures. Everything looked reasonable to me as I went down the various line items. You can see on the last page that we're only 20.5% spent 
on the expenditure side for water, which is lower than the 25%, would be, you know, the annualized amount. And the reason for that is because our large debt payments haven't been made yet. They're made in December and June. So once you factor that in, we're right on target where we would expect to be there. So any questions on water? Okay, moving on, solid waste um, operations is your last stack of papers there. The first page and three quarters of the next page are the revenues. You can see the first group of revenues there are other taxes and licenses. This is your um, scrap tire, white goods, and solid waste disposal taxes that we get distributed quarterly from the state. We've received one distribution there for each of those. So you can see we're slightly above. Um, we'd expect that to be at 25%. We're at 28.8%, so that's good. Um, next, the scrap tire disposal. That is an annual distribution. So came in slightly below what I thought we would collect there because we will not receive any more of that for the rest of the year. And then next is our big revenue for solid waste. That's the solid waste annual fee that is billed on the tax bills, that $170 fee there. And of course, um, not collected much of that yet, but that's normal. As I've said, you know, with the tax bills, most people pay in November and December. Um, so we will expect to collect most of that revenue in the next couple of months coming up, but we have collected uh, over 700000 already in the first three months there. And moving on to the last page, you can see a detailed listing on the expenditure side for solid waste. And solid waste expenditures are, are at about 15% spent so far for the year, so well below um, the 25% which we would expect. Any questions? Any, any questions? Okay. Thank you, Thank you Anita. Uh, Katie, you're up with the uh, yes, with the bids and offer to purchase property? Yes, sir. We have um, three properties that are currently available and have received $100 bids on all three of them. As a reminder, these properties are going to be listed on GovDeals. Um, for these three properties and in anticipation of your approval I've gone ahead and made an appoint a meeting with our GovDeal representative to make sure everything goes smoothly we reach as many people as possible and that it's done correctly okay we got a motion is there a second second and a second all those in favor I'm sorry any comments okay all those in favor raise your right hand thank you uh, we're down to items for decision. Uh, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner Rebels, I ask that this be put on the agenda and be held on the agenda for a while, the uh, broadband negotiation update. I, I don't really have much of an update for you since the last meeting. We are still waiting to see how um, the great grant bill comes out of out of the General Assembly. I would tell you that one of the things that, that we are watching very closely and concerns us a little bit um, is just the definition and in that bill that talks about unserved and underserved. Um, and, and the issue there is it, it reads a location within a county that has no deployment of broadband services or that has internet access that do not meet the definition of broadband. They're defining broadband as 25 uh, down and three up. Um, the issue, though, is it also reads unserved or underserved areas where a private provider has been designated to receive funds through other state or federally funded programs designed specifically for broadband deployment shall be considered served if such funding is intended to result in construction of broadband in the area within 18 months or for the duration of the federal funding program for that area or if the funding recipient is otherwise in good standing with the funding agency regulations governing the funding program. So you recall last meeting we spoke about the south side where there was federal RDOF funding, Rural Development Opportunity Fund funding that came in that some of the uh, larger companies got money. Uh, and it's a patchwork across the southern uh, part of the county where they've received federal money to put broadband in. I think that program, I went to look at it today and couldn't find the, the final number. I think it's a six-year program. They've got to get it in within six years. Um, but what it does is it, it kind of eliminates our ability, or, or we, we, we're concerned that it may eliminate our ability to put together a great grant 
application that would allow us to get into the southern part of the county because according to this you can't you can't go to areas that have already been funded by some other by a federal funding source um, so that that's a concern we have with this language that's been expressed I know the association has expressed it as well we'll just see how that all shakes out I'll be able to answer any questions maybe if you have any 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 questions in in your discussions um, is there is there another option or some alternatives that we might be able to work on as it relates to uh, a tower or towers uh, well I think there I mean there there is well I say there is that that would be a that would be a conversation for the providers to tell us under a wireless you know originally with great grant because great grant is a three-year grant or it used to be three-year grant um, you got to move fairly quickly to do that and you, and you really couldn't do a large project by putting fiber in the ground under a three-year grant um, so most of the great grant provisions or most of the great grant projects my understanding the providers look to do a fixed wireless solution because you can do it fairly quickly and that was what was proposed as you recall when we put out our RFP uh, to seek broadband providers when our current our current partner River Street came back they proposed to us doing a fixed wireless solution um, so that it could quickly be done and then continue to build out those areas with fiber as you got additional grants so there is that opportunity. It's just, would we be able to receive a great grant to help bolster that and get through those areas and do some things when there's already some some RDOL funding in those areas? So that's the challenge. <laughs> I don't anticipate. I mean, we're not the only county in North Carolina that's got that issue. I can assure you, right. there was a large uh, amount of RDOL funds that went out across North Carolina. So um, we'll see how it all shakes. We're not we're not alone in that situation. Commissioner Redbottoms. Brian, do you know when RDOL was awarded? Um, when you said six years, and yeah, the, the um, they were going through. You know, they started out. They had a short form. They submitted their stuff. Then they went through a long form process. My understanding is in July they finished up the long form process. Um, they have had some defaults already, where companies have said no, we can't do it for the for the amount of money you gave us. So we're defaulting on that, or we're turning that back in. Um, they did have a list today that I found where. Um, those agencies or those private providers had gone through the final long form process and been approved so they had a list of approved ones that were ready to move forward there were none in north carolina that i saw that had gotten through that process yet and been approved yet for funding so i don't, I don't know when it will happen any other questions on that you want to move to your next item Yes, I'd be glad to. This was an item that was on the agenda last meeting that the board asked for, for it to come back. This is the classification addition to the salary grade list. And, and just for, for the short of it, um, you'll see on page 215 is the org chart that shows where the assistant director of 911 is located. Um, this is an org chart that was in the, um, the budget last year, two years ago. Um, in last year's budget, since the board allocated just FTEs to the sheriff's office, we just showed the FTEs. But in prior years, ever since I've been here, we've actually had this same org chart. So um, the short of it is, when we did the study, we missed that position. And that's on us. That's not on the sheriff's office. We, we, we missed getting that position in the right place. Um, and this puts that position in the right place. They are not, in doing this, you are not adding any positions to the sheriff's office. There are no additional FTEs that are going. There's no additional funding being added. This is simply saying, this is where this position, used, this is where this position is operating. This is where it should be. This is where it should be paid on the pay scale. And we're just asking that you allow us to put that in and make it right the way it should be. Uh, questions? Yes. Uh, have we always had an assistant manager? Ever since we, I think the position really became, and when you say assistant manager, I mean, that's what we're calling it, but it's, it, it is when the board approved the EMD, when we put in emergency medical dispatch and, we, and the board added like four additional uh, telecommunicators over there so that we could handle the the pre-arrival instructions and things like that for people who need medical emergencies that was the primary role of that person because there's a lot of auditing that they have to do they have to review a certain number of calls they have to make sure that things are going by the protocol 
Um, so as I recall, that was when that that position became really substantial in what it did. And, it's, and, and like I say, we just when we went through that process, I, it was one. You know, we missed a couple of them, unfortunately. I mean, it's on us, uh, and we just missed that one in, in picking it up. But if we if we put on four additional people to do that, that would have been one for each shift. There was not have been an assistant manager. We added an additional telecommunicator for each shift to cover the now to cover the EMD. We had to add an additional shift person. There was four people added, so that was there an was, additional yes, shift sir. person. Yes, sir. There was, so, there was an additional shift person. I don't remember having a uh, having an assistant manager. This is, I mean, if you go back and looking at our org charts, it's been there for five, six. I mean, it's it's been there, I think, since I've, I've been here, at least three or four, at least four or five years. Other question? Entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Got a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the recommendation, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Uh, Brian, you've got the next item, Legends and Lure marker land permission letter. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, it's a request from the City of Washington. They are applying for a Legends and Lure marker grant program to install a marker at the old courthouse. Um, it is to highlight the, the story of the ghost of Reverend George Carawan. Um, they need a letter from the county because we are the owner of that property. If that award is granted to uh, to say that you would allow them to put that marker on county property. So um, that's what their request is. You have the supporting documentation and, and um, we would recommend your approval. Got a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a second. Have, has anybody heard heard this story? I've, I've heard it. And uh, if I understand it correctly, the. The Reverend ended up taking a gun into the courtroom. It's my understanding that the, the Reverend was on trial and he, he uh, was in the courtroom and, and he was found guilty and he stood up and shot the, um, uh, the, the, the district attorney who was prosecuting him and then he pulled out another weapon and, and shot and killed himself. And now he haunts the, um, yeah. now he haunts the courthouse. The old and, courthouse. And this Reverend was from Sladesville, Scranton area in Hyde County. If I remember that part of it, um, did we get a motion and a second? Yeah. Okay. I got did a we, question. Did the county have any say so where the marker would be where the marker would be placed? Uh, the, the, as you see on the um, as you see on their note, that's where they were propose it. Um, but yes, we obviously, if, it, if it's if it's on our part, we can certainly work with them to get it in the right place so it's not in the way or, or causing a hazard for whatever. So, but yes, you, you would, and, and that wouldn't be a problem. Okay, all those in favor? We never voted, did we? Okay, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Stan, are you? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, the item we had pulled. Lloyd, will you come up and we'll do that before we get into the commissioner's uh, agenda items? You might want to turn to page 19 in your book. Uh, I raised a question on uh, Wilkinson Solar and also Chaco Entity Solar. Um, and the reason I pulled it out is because of the amount of money. And uh, I sent Lloyd an, an email, so. If you'll just tell us why the why the large refund? Absolutely. So I'm going to actually read something to you real briefly. My assistant assessor handles a lot of the uh, quality control for office, looks over a lot of the records, sees how a lot of that goes. I had her put it into words for me, and uh, then I'm going to be happy to, to address anything with this. Basically, on uh, the 7th of September, representative for Chocolate Solar requested the work papers for their business abstract. That's common. People want to see, you know, the listing, what we've done with it, what we've added to it, what we, where we've gone with that. After the review of that abstract, and the, then the representative asked why the depreciation factor, and I'll kind of elaborate on that, was not the same as the North Carolina Department of Revenue's T18 schedule for solar panels. 
commonly what our office uses for solar panels, a schedule, a depreciation schedule that was determined by the state. Solar panels seem to be in line with what we feel they should be depreciated at. We use the one that's called the T18. The T18 schedule, uh, simply put, as we just alluded to, was done by the North Carolina Department of Revenue. Due to that question, we reviewed that schedule. We compared it to what our vendor, uh, Farragut, uh, North Carolina Property Tax Systems, that we do, of course, contract with that we use for our software in the tax department. We, um, we started looking at that and compared it to what Farragut, the vendor for billing and tax, had loaded into the system. Now, they loaded that last year. So again, to repeat, depreciation schedule. We put it into the system. It works against the values. It depreciates the values. It goes in. The state sends the schedules. We send the state schedule to Farragut. So Farragut puts all of that in. This was done last December before I had taken over. Essentially, when that happens, um, we've noticed there was a schedule conflict. There was a problem with the schedule. A lot of the schedules will do certain percentage drop each year. T18 usually referring to an 18-year schedule or something to that effect. So there was a mistake in it that we saw. All properties were then researched. We found nine properties in the system. Four of those properties had been paid. Now, that's the solar panels we're talking about here, these specific ones. Those other uh, properties, well, again, were, were researched. I apologize. And then we did, the other companies were contacted due to the correction on the T18 schedule, generating refunds to them. When a schedule is changed, updated, correct, et cetera, it changes everything in the system on what that schedule then recalculation occurs. We have four down here. I think there's only two that were of a high number. We did have two others that will get some refund. I will also say these are on an exemption to a partial exemption based on a state program, the way that works. I think it's the 80 20, or something to that effect. But these were the amounts that the state schedule that they supplied was put in. There was a, a mistake in it. Uh, my assistant thinks that was mentioned back last year. Again, it may have been. I, I wasn't fully in here until January 1st. I don't remember if it was or not, to be honest with you, but I know that it was put in and it was not caught until recently. That's it. Do, does the state get involved in land values as it relates to so solar farms? Not, well, yes and no. Okay. <laughs> so so it's, it, this is one of those, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be brief, but we'll be happy to elaborate more. So a lot of times, depending on the owner of the farm and the equipment and everything else, the state gets very involved. They get very much. If it's a private entity, then the case is normally no. So we have done a few things out there. Uh, one time before this particular farm, I believe something came through here one time on that, um, on that solar farm where basically uh, we looked at it and reviewed it for discrepancy. There were some things broke out or something to that effect on the land, if I recall. Um, there's an exemption on part of it, again, not uncommon, solar farms, there's some stuff like that, but no, not normally, unless it's something that's owned, of course, by a exempt entity. I guess so say. we we determine the land value, luckily, not... In this specific case, I'm, yes, fairly certain we did. Now, again, there's like the, the airport, I think, has some so things like that. It's, it's a little bit different scenario. Wil state Wilkinson has. owns one track of land and leases two. That is correct, sir. And I'm, I'm assuming... More now, but yeah, but I'm assuming the that. land value is the same whether it's leased or whether it's owned. That should be correct, yes, sir. Okay. By the private entity. Yes, Any anyone else have a question? But not just. But this isn't the, for the land. This is just for right. solar panel depreciation for the equipment. Yeah. Just just uh, just to clarify the eighty twenty thing. These people are only taxed at twenty percent to begin with of the original capital value. Yes, if I recall, um, if I recall the way that that actually works, is that set up again? That's a one of the exemption programs set up by the state for those programs and everything else, and we're following, of course, state mandate at that point for that. So then, then the twenty percent is put on a what an eighteen-year schedule, straight yeah. line. Yeah, I believe it is. A eighteen it should be an eighteen-year schedule. If I remember correctly, in my research when we were talking hot and heavy about yeah. it, I think the salvage value is twenty-five percent of what that investment is. So it never goes to zero. It never goes below 25%. Yeah, I think it's 25. That's, so basically, most of your schedules have a residual factor, yeah. too. And you, you hit eventually a residual. And 25 is a very common residual right. percentage of most of these. The thing to remember, though, you are still talking a very large amount of money. I mean, most of those have a lot of, obviously, a lot of purchase price and so on and so forth. Anybody else have a question? OK, we need a motion to approve the uh, refund. Is there a second? 
Second. Okay, we have any further discussion? All right. All those in favor of the ref two refunds? Or actually, all of the refunds. Raise your right hand. Thank you. All right, we're down to uh, Commissioner Richardson. If you just take your items and just go from one to the next. Okay, well, I, I just want to be, I'm keeping mega sites on here because I'm still hoping, I'm still hoping, I'm keeping mega sites on here because I'm still hoping that somebody will, uh, somewhere will allow us to build these uh, waste sites because it is waste and it is infrastructure and that's, that's the only reason this is on here. To ask the managers anything new to report. Okay, same old, same old. All right. Going to the next one, public library improvements. This, this is the same question. Okay. You're on a roll. Okay. Martin County Water System. I, I, I make a motion that Beaufort County not do the interconnection to the Martin County water system. And I'm going to review the reasons for it. And the reason I'm making this motion is it was talked about and taken off the table at the last meeting. But things have a way of happening without commissioners knowing about it. And I want to make sure that we do not connect to the Martin County water system. The reason is because Beaufort County is very unique in the world of providing water to our people. That is, we have the Castle Hain Aquifer, which is a virtually unlimited source of good water. Martin County takes their water, most of their water comes, is to put it in my term, swamp water that is treated. I know people that live in Martin County. They tell me the water has an odor, a taste, and a color to it that is not desirable. Martin County pays twice as much for water as people in Beaufort County pay for water. We should never connect our water system to an inferior water system. So that is a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. Discussion? Yes. Commissioner Rebottles. Would you modify that motion that we do not, we would not connect to Martin without approval of the board? Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. The board can always reverse itself. So if you want that language in there, that's fine with me. What board? This board. This board. <laughs> well, my, my position is I'm, I'm going to vote against the motion. Uh, I think it's a good neighbor, and I'll use the example of Hyde County. Hyde County is connected to Beaufort County. And I'm served by the Hyde County water system, and I just think it's good business. It doesn't mean that we're going to turn the valve and and uh, just flood water over there or flood water in our system, but in case of an emergency, things can happen. So I just think it's being uh, just being a bad neighbor. I'm not concerned about the water. Uh, Commissioner Waters, apparently you didn't live in Beaufort County when we had the trihalo methanes issue. You only get trihalo methanes when you treat swamp water. That water the city took at that time was coming from Tranter's Creek, which is surface water, which is swamp water. It was treated and it had trihalo methanes in it. We are connecting to a system that has inferior water, and we don't need to be doing that. Any other comment? All right. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. All those opposed, raise your right hand. Are do you three on the water committee? No, I'm not. You're not. Okay. No, but I, 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 you are. But you go. But I just, I just, I just, I just agree with uh, <laughs> what these two gentlemen said. Yeah. Good neighbors. Good neighbors and poisoned water are not good. Is not a good idea. Well, I don't know if anybody has died over Martin County recently. Do you? I mean, no, I, it, somebody died today huh? from water. In, in Martin County? It wasn't from water. Huh? Okay. That's my whole point. Okay, you want to get to your next item? Oh, okay. Uh, video. Uh, these video. Filming these meetings has become a serious problem. At one time, we had a private contractor who's sitting on the other end of the table from me, and we had a good quality, and we had good service, and the, and the programs went up reasonably quick. 
Uh, we got that for about $27,000 a year, okay? Yep. Am I correct in that number? Uh, then we spent $140,000 in round numbers, maybe more, maybe a little less, for a modern, sophisticated system. And immediately the quality went down to the bottom of the barrel. And I've been talking now for two years, ever since we've been in this building, about how to get the quality up. We had a police committee meeting this month. At the end of the police committee meeting, the, when I thought we had a very good meeting with a lot of information that could be gotten out to the public. At the end of the meeting, the operator came in and suddenly announced, gee, guys, we didn't get any of the video or audio. Oh, yeah. We didn't get any of the audio. So with a $140,000 system, we should have gold-plated stuff being turned out. I don't know about you guys, but the way this thing shows up on my TV, it, it looks like it's filmed at the bottom of the barrel. It's grainy. Uh, it's hard to see. It's fuzzy. Uh, I'm looking at this. The quality that I'm looking at on the monitors in this room is incredible compared to what we're getting at home. Now, this is going to be fixed because we've spent our money. So I have some questions for the manager as to what our policies are and how we go about this. First of all, I think that every meeting should be immediately stopped as soon as the operator determines that we're not getting the video or the audio. That should be announced to the people that are sitting in the meeting, that are chairing the meeting, should know about that. So can we do that in the future? If the board would like for us to put in policies that, that way, we can certainly do that. I, I'll speak to the issue that occurred the other night. We had some issues, as you recall, um, when we moved stuff around when COVID. We, we, we moved this desk. We put you all down here. We put stuff over there. We moved our entire system around. When we put it back together and got it back in place, there was a connection that got missed. Something happened where we were unable to connect to the HDMI from these tables. The document camera wasn't working, so we had some issues. We got AV audio back in, or AV uh, video back, Auburn, Auburn video back in here to look at it. They did that. It took them a while, obviously. That was last week, week before they finally got in here and were able to do it. They've resolved all those issues. While they were back there working and finding stuff, there is a, there is a small power strip that powers um, the audio amplifier back there. It got disconnected somehow while they were working. We didn't know it. If we would have known it, we would have fixed it. Um, but but that was resolved after we got into it the next day. So that's the issue. If if the board would want for us to say you can cancel your meetings if there's an issue, we're certainly glad to tell you anytime there's an issue. Uh, I'm not advocating that we cancel a meeting uh, necessarily, but I'm advocating that the board be notified so the board can make a decision as to what it does want to do. The second question that comes into this when you talk about notifying the board uh, if part of the program is not being uh, captured is um, is there a pretest done before every meeting to be sure that the system is operating properly Mr. Reeser, we do we do turn the system on. As you recall, the other night um, we had an issue with uh, with the uh, the podium mic, so we try we use this mic over here to do that. So we test the mics. Um, we just did not see in the back where it was because the video had to come on before they could see that it wasn't having issues. So, uh, but we do we we power everything up. I came over today to make sure we were good. Turn some mics on. Check some things. So we do do that. I mean, it's our intent to try to do it right. It, we're certainly not doing it intentionally. So. <clears throat> what it, what no stuff doesn't just happen too much stuff has happened we lost a whole meeting two meetings ago where they were accusing commissioner Deathridge of being a criminal and that meeting never really got out into the public and it should have gotten out into the public not that he is a criminal but the public needs to know what the issues are and that's why I'm talking about this so I, you know I think that there should be a pretest on every meeting uh, have the people that are operating this, have they been trained by anybody? We do have staff that has been trained by audio, by the AV folks. Um, but what I will say to you is that our staff is doing this in addition to their other job. So I would be happy if the board would entertain another FTE to be a, 
a public information officer, video person, and a host of other duties that we could assign them with to handle public relations related to board activities. Um, if the board would consider that, I'd, I'd certainly jump all over that and be glad to have you, someone who was, uh, uh, who does that, who did that for a living, be able to do that for us. We had Randy over there. Mr. 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 Matt, Mr. We Mr. had as cheap as we were going to get, and y'all fired him. Mr. Mr. Matt, excuse me. Are you finished? Are you I, my button is still on. I thought I still had the okay. floor. Are you okay. telling me I'm finished? No, no, no. I just asked a question. Well, then I'm not finished. Okay. No, but, but I'm getting real close to being finished. I, I, you know, when people finish in here, I want to make the motion that the, the system be cranked up before each meeting and tested and that the board or whoever is meeting be notified immediately that we're not picking up audio and or video so that a decision can be made about how to proceed with the meeting. Be, uh, before you make that motion, uh, I'd like to No, speak. I'd like these press, everybody to speak for Okay, okay. Can I go? Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, I'm not a criminal, but, but, what, but what is criminal is first to have this expensive, elaborate system, and we record in 360 dots per inch, P, pixels per inch. And... Uh, I would suggest that we record every meeting in 1080p and upload it at least in 700, 720p. And if you would put that in, in your motion, I, I would appreciate that. That would reduce the graininess. And t 1080 would eliminate the, gra the graininess. I, I do believe that this system records in four, can record in 4K. The problem with that is going to be what they show it on in cable. But, they, but it can be recorded in 4K, reduced uh, to 1080p. Right, but it, it, where we were showing it at uh, Sudden Link, it was uh, it was just a basic yeah. DVD player. So they didn't have the ability. Now, if you want to have a discussion of being able to wire it right in there, that mm -hmm. is coming up. And I think that's the future. Uh, to be able to for them to download it and then you could be at that same level you're talking about even even, even more. 1080 right 1080 would be great yep so mr chairman if i can speak to that yes um so there were some issues with sudden lake obviously as y'all recall um suddenly closed their local office that was our avenue for getting those meetings broadcast on the local Sudden Link channel. We, other, we do have other channels that we broadcast to. Uh, the City of Washington helps us on their PEG channel, and River Street does it on theirs, as well as um, we, we have it listed on the YouTube channel. Um, have had conversations, those have been slow conversations with Sudden Link, but they have agreed now that they will set up a drop box at the Hackney Avenue location where we can drop off a DVD again. They will put it in and play it. Um, I think it's actually going to come out of the head-in in Newburn. Um, but they've also given us some additional information that if the board... The question he asked me was, well, are your folks willing to spend some money? Um, because what they're talking about, if you want to send it directly to them at the head end, it requires a, a uh, what they call a hypercaster um, peg broadcasting piece of equipment where, um, and I have a meeting scheduled with their engineers tomorrow to answer some questions that I have about it. But this would, it's my understanding this would allow us to stream, because what I wanted to do was make sure we could stream and rebroadcast. My understanding is we have the encoder, we have a dual channel encoder back there that we could do both. Um, we could both send it to our normal, um, our normal stream and then also send the, the dual stream to them. But I wanted to confirm that with their engineers first. Um, this would then allow us to stream the meetings through the peg through their access channel also upload the videos and whichever videos those are and then schedule them so the question i also had on that was would we be handling the scheduling they would actually host this piece of equipment in their head in you would obviously pay for it but they would host it in their head in and my hope would be that we would have access to handle that scheduling but that's the questions i have for them um this is about a ten thousand dollar piece of equipment so um but but those they have provided those options to us if that's what you want to do um we just need to know and, and again we're still watching it well mr manager i want you to tell the young lady i think she's i think she's doing a very good job oh, thank you commissioner Booth. um Melissa does an absolutely fantastic job. Um, it's
it's it's not part of her. It's it's one of her other duties as assigned, and I think she does a great job well, as well as as well as Marshall. Marshall does the work as well for us, and and again, that's another um, other duty as assigned. So thank you. You test the airplane before you get on them, and they still crash. So so stuff happens. If if we do get this, are able to get this system, I'd like to see it on 24 hours a day, unless Marshall probably could come up with. You know, information. You know, or even if it's if promoting Beaufort County stuff. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. You got to remember, of course, this is not our peg channel. This would be theirs, and it's their government access channel. So I don't know that that would necessarily give us the ability to to control that entire channel. But we can certainly have well, those conversations. It, I would say to you this: um, you're 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 again adding additional duties to our folks um, who is other duties is assigned and I would put forward to you if, if you really want to make this thing right I can I can handle that with another FTE. Any other discussion? All right. It, it, one more thing it, in your discussions tomorrow just ask them about who could control the, the channel because I think that's a great way we talked about how to how do we get information out to people this is a great way to do it. Yeah, I mean, that was part of my list of things I had to ask him because I wanted to make sure that I wanted to know who was scheduling it because in reading the brochure that they sent me, it says you, know, you upload it and you can schedule it. Well, I, we, I would want us to be able to schedule it so that if we had multiple meetings going on, we could upload multiple meetings and say on this date you're playing this meeting, on this date you're playing this meeting, things like that, or you could play them multiple times a day. Okay, I'm I, I'm going to oppose the motion because I think the staff's doing a good job. Anybody else got anything to say? Yeah, I want to make my motion. Good. You've already made it. Yes, you have, yeah. No, I really haven't. No, I haven't made it. I just said I would wait to make it. Yeah, he would have listened until everybody had had spoken. Uh, you you made a motion and then he asked if he could amend it. No, he asked me if I would amend it to include pixels. In right. It. We'll do it then. Yeah, just do it again. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, I, I move that a test be performed before each meeting to assure that the, that the system is working properly, that notice be given to the uh, whoever's conducting the meeting, that uh, uh, should a defect occur, and number three, that we record it in higher than 360 pixels. Uh, and, and dispense it in higher than 360 yeah, pixels. Minimum of 720 pixels. Well, uh, you want to say a minimum of, minimum seven, of 720 does pixels? Does that work? I think you're going to have to wait until that can be shown if it, it suddenly agrees that they have a way to show that because that's a different player uh, for them to show that. So that uh, if, if we get this machine, this uh, add-on to stream it, yes. But if you're putting it on a DVD and drop putting it in a Dropbox, it, that's not going to be accurate. Well, let's just say higher than 360 pixels, and then if you, if you get the new machine, then you can do it in higher than 360 pixels. Okay. Does that work? That's my motion. You're that to I, the highest I, pixels possible. To the high. Okay. To the I highest made it, pixels. I made it. I made it look so easy all those years. Candy, so I, Candy, do you want them to restate it, or you got it? You got it. All right. Anybody else got a comment? All right, let's call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. All those opposed. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Well, I mean, you go ahead. You make every, you make everything else political, so we expect that. We expect it. Truth on you. I want to know what happened. Yeah. And it's going to be the public's ears are going to burn. Yeah. Technical problems happen, just like. With an airplane, so you go ahead. I'm going to do the political problem with that. Are you are you finished? Yes, you've had your chance. So. Okay. All right. We're down to uh, Commissioner Stan Dethridge. Mr. Chairman, real quick, could I I'm just sorry. ask that question? Do you want me to continue to pursue this opportunity for streaming and and uploading to Sudden Link instead of just a Dropbox DVD? I mean, I. I have no problems with it continuing to investigate it. Okay. I, I, I just mean, want to make sure. Just want to yeah. make sure. Thank you. To investigate. Do you need that to be a motion? No. Okay. Uh, all right. Commissioner Dethridge. Okay. We're all done. Okay. There's a question here. 
and this question to you Beaufort County Commissioners and every North Carolina law enforcement agency is, when does the propriety of laws equally applied matter? The perfect and essential answer is that it matters for every citizen all the time, no exceptions. That is the question of, of, of this entire event that we're getting ready to, to discuss. What is of extreme concern to me and, and should be the concern of every fair-minded Beaufort County citizen is that on occasion this constitutional guaranteed of equal appli application of the law as related to me for at least this one instance has not been the maximum of our authority class. To be specific, an incident where the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office spanning two administrations failed to investigate the threatened extreme violation of a minor and then the eventual complete violation of that same minor formerly threatened did occur. My overarching question is, at what point does the Beaufort County Commissioners care to get involved to aid a Beaufort County citizen to seek redress for his family's constitutionally guaranteed justice denied against the evil perpetrated that this citizen has now claimed. That citizen mentioned in this Beaufort County Citizens Court of Business is Beaufort County citizen Bruce Gray. Would you like to come forward, sir? <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Gray, do you come before these Beaufort County Commissioners on your own volition, on your own free will? Oh, yes, I do. And you, you intend to speak honestly? Oh, yes, as sir. As you know it? Completely. Uh, would you now sp speak to this particular problem before these Commissioners and this people's co political court of the people's governance? This is uh, concerning uh, children being sexually molested and trafficked and, and me trying to get some justice in, in stopping this. Um, at six years old, my child, when my child was six years old, was the first time that I was threatened to be killed by this um, criminal organization that uh, traffics women and children here. And um, when I, they were threatened to kill me, I um, got up with a, a friend, I thought was a friend of mine, that I had worked with previously. Um, his name is uh, David Richards. And um, I, I got up with him because we had worked together at Park Boat Company before he became a sheriff. And asked him to come to my house and let's discuss how to properly turn this situation in um, with this organization. And instead of him coming by himself, he brought um, Mike Holloman and Russell Davenport with him. Um, they proceeded to tell me that they knew all about these people and I was to keep my nose out of it and not to be turning them in um, instead of giving any kind of help on how to properly turn it in. Um, at that point, I, I continued trying to reach out to the Sheriff's Department to get help and on a few occasions was told that, um, that they knew and, and I was not be turning them in, to stop turning them in. At 11 years old, my child was actually um, raped by these people. And um, when I went in to talk to the investigating officer, Brad Shackerford was called into his office. He met me in the hallway, asked if I was Bruce Gray, and I said, yes, sir, I am. The next words out of his mouth was, it's only prostitution. Um, at that point, I let him know that I saw what he was trying to do, and, and we needed to take care of my child. Um, go in and, and which my child was in his office at that time. 
and uh, we went in and talked with the um, lady from DSS and, and my child about what had happened. Um, when I couldn't get any help with previous to this happening, when I, I worked with the Sheriff's Department for that first year, the next year I went to the SBI, Walter Brown of the SBI, and uh, he told me that he would look into it, and he did. Um, and he let me know that he saw that everything I told him was the truth. And he suggested or to the Sheriff's Department to do an investigation. And I asked him, did he think that he, they would do it? And he said, no, he had no, he didn't think that they would. Um, but he had told them and that was all he could do. And I asked him, well, you know, I thought you guys could do an investigation and yourselves. And he said that the only two people that could ask him to uh, get involved was the district attorney and the sheriff. And um, so when I couldn't get help there, I went to the FBI. The FBI then let me know that I needed to, that they couldn't get involved either unless these two people um, asked them to get involved. Um, at that point, um, they did suggest that I start being that the sheriff's department weren't making any reports or let me report or to um, go to the National Organization Against Human Trafficking. I um, worked with them for now about six years in reporting these people and reporting the sheriff's department for not helping um, and the Department of Social Services too. Uh, I was actually uh, told by two different supervisors of the Department of Social Services um, that uh, Abby Williams the last time and Barry Johnson in the beginning um, that they knew and I was not to be turning these people in. In fact, if I kept turning them in, they would take my child from me and place her with her mother who is one of the people in this organization. In fact, her mother was the one that um, supposedly tied her to the bed and let a man rape her in this stuff. Wow. Um, and that's what, you know, DSS it did when they actually put on court papers that I hadn't turned it into the proper authorities and took my child for two years, placing her with her mother. Suppose I, I have full custody. Supposed to be my choice of where my child was to be placed, but um, they placed her with her mother's family, who tried to um, change, have her change her mind about why it happened, and thank the Lord for the therapist, not um, um, not letting them have contact um, with these people anymore, and. Um, and telling them to reunite us. Um, that's the only way that I was able to get my child back from the Department of Social Services was through our therapist and, and the Lord. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a little hard to talk about sometimes. Uh, there again, thank the, thank the Lord for the therapist. They've done a, a great job. Um, Mr. Gray, may I ask a question? Of, of course. Uh, you say at 11 your child was, was physically violated. Yes. Did a doctor... Uh, I took her, as soon as I found out, I took her to the Children's Hospital in Greenville. Did he certify that she was, in fact, yes. raped? Yes. Did you make that information uh, available to the uh, various law enforcement agencies that you spoke to? Um, uh, not at that time. I have not. Um, I did, um, they told me to go to um, um, a teddy bear in Greenville to, for treatment for my child. And at that time, Brad Shackerford was called in there also and, and was made aware at the meeting with teddy bear. And was, was he told at that time of oh, he, all the instances oh, and everything yes. that happened? 
uh, your your former wife's in, involvement as well? Now, I'm not sure about the, the wife thing. Uh, you know, she weren't my wife either. Um, oh, okay. Okay. You're, you're right. The, the mother of the child. The mother I'm sorry. of the child. I'm sorry. Right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It, it's all right. And he was, he was, he may have, may or may not have been informed at that time of her. About home. that part, yes, sir. Um, but that she had been um, raped. Um, but that was definite. Oh, yes, sir. That was definite. Um, and um, in the office of Teddy Bear with, with the therapist. And, and they are aware of such and they made record of such. Yes. Okay. Um, at uh, that point, when your child was 11, you worked with the sheriff's department for one year. So you said that was that was when she was six for one year. Once six for one year. At 11, did you work with the sheriff's department to try to get? Uh, how can you work with somebody that says it's only prostitution? Well, that is not. That was that was poorly put. Sadly, I was At very 11 years put. old. Um, <sighs> And uh, at uh, at that time, you did contact the SBI. Oh, I I done that after one year of working with the sheriff's department when she was six. Okay. Uh, when she turns about seven years old, yeah. is when I started working with the SBI, and then informed the FBI um, after working with the SBI for one year, and um, him telling me that he saw that what I was saying was true. Um, and he suggested them doing an investigation, and he also let me know that he had no idea that they would. At 11, uh, when when that uh, incident terribly occurred, uh, were you did you feel powerless or? Of course. Uh, when you look into the people that you're supposed to look to for help, and and to be told that uh, you know that. Um, not to be turning these people in. Um, I may have some more questions later. Does anybody else have any questions? Do you have an attorney? I've tried to get an attorney. I cannot get an attorney to even look at the proof that I have in paperwork. You cannot? No, sir. Thank you. I've tried. Well, I, when when you say uh, you presented evidence to the sheriff's department that a crime had been committed, and you, you say that your your daughter was tied to a bed at rape, and then was taken to the teddy bear clinic, in relationship to time of the actual rape and the time that went to the teddy bear clinic, how much time are we talking about? Um, she was. She didn't tell about it until it was about, I'm guessing, about three months before she told somebody at our church about what had happened. And then DSS come out and asked me about it, and that's when I found out. Okay, so, so the Department of Social Services actually was doing an investigation? They're the ones that come out and, and told me and that, then, that it right. had been reported. As a result, child. as a result of their investigation, they in turn turned over the whatever information they had to the sheriff's department. I, I'm assuming so. And so, and then you you're saying to me that the sheriff's department did nothing. And so, my next question is, what did you say to the district attorney's office? I, I was told by the SBI to write um, the district attorney a letter, and I did, and. That was part of the year that I worked with the SBI. You, you, you're somewhat confusing me. I All understand. Right. And this, this is this is from my point of view, and I'm not calling you a liar because I, I really don't know. Uh, if, if my daughter had been raped, and the sheriff's department would not do anything, I would not write a letter to the district attorney's office. I would, in fact, go to the district attorney's office and demand to talk to the district attorney. He, in turn, could force the sheriff's department to do the investigation. But you also say that you talked to the SBI and that they said that you actually had a case, but they couldn't do anything with it. 
So my next question is, did you talk to the Attorney General? He is the highest law enforcement officer in the state of North Carolina. No, sir. I, I don't know that much about the law. I'm just a regular working man, and I, now that, I, that may have been my fault um, by not doing that. But uh, man, well, let, let, let me ask you this. Was there anybody advising you on what you should be doing? Um, the the uh, S man from SBI, Walter Brown, advised me, but this his he was advising me before the rape of my child. Let, let me let me say this: I, I was a I was a deputy for fourteen years, and I did investigations and. I hear what you're saying, but the dots are not connecting for me. That's that's the problem I have. Your dots are just not connecting. And, I, and I've been away from the Sheriff's Department since 1996. So, you know, and I, <laughs> such an egregious crime for any law enforcement officer to hear such a thing and to and to ignore. That's just a tough one for me. It's hard for me to believe also. Okay, thank you. Uh, concerning your therapist, uh, is it the therapist who you sought or were you told this therapist is who you need to get? And, and are you, you paying for the therapist yourself? Oh, I, yes, I did. Okay, so how did you... How did you get this therapist? How did you know to contact this therapist? Um, when I was over at the teddy bear clinic, I, I broke down and asked the lady that I needed help as well. Okay. And and she advised me to this lady. And it's the same therapist helping you as your daughter? No. So you have two, two different Two therapists. separate therapists. And you're paying for them yourself? I, no, she's being done through the Department of Social Service. Okay, and you're but you're paying for your therapist? Yes. Gotcha. Um, when did DSS get in, first involved? I think you told us it was after the first uh, first threat, uh, when uh, your daughter was around seven, six, seven. Am um, I right? Yes, that's that's right. Did did they believe you, or did they find you credible? Uh, Barry Johnson again told me not to be turning these people in. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you, you felt at that point you weren't getting any service from them. You didn't feel like you were getting any service from the Beaver County Sheriff's Department at that time because it was only prostitution. Um, then you found out about the mother of the child, probably from the child. Am I right? Um, n no. no. Uh, I, I found this out through the Department of Social Services. They found oh, out. Oh, okay. That, that, that's what my child had told them. Like oh. I said, my child didn't tell me. Oh well, let's. Um, she told somebody, in and I've always told my child, if anything was to happen, and you didn't feel comfortable telling your daddy, to tell somebody that you trusted, and and she did. She told the people in church. At, at that point, when your daughter told the Department of Social Services, they they did not no longer wanted to place a child with the mother or the mother's family, or did they still want to do that? Uh, that happened. Uh, uh, sometime later is when they actually said that I hadn't turned it into the proper authorities and took it, even though they're the ones that told me about it. Well, they are the proper authorities. Right. Yes, sir. I mean, they... All right. It seems like a lot of buck, a lot of the, a lot's being passed. Now, Mr. Gray has admitted he's a simple man, and a lot of people are simple. I'm simple in situations like this, and I don't always do the right thing, although I wish I would. And maybe I wish you, I knew the right things. And, and maybe you didn't know the that right things to do. And maybe you went up to doors that were closed into your face, it sounds like to me. And That's this true. is his story. Is it true or not? Is that for us to even decide? It's not for us to decide. I don't think it's for us to decide. What we should decide is should this be investigated at some level here in North Carolina? Finally, be investigated. I understand what you're saying, Commissioner, but I don't think there's, out of these seven commissioners sitting up here on this dais, none of us have the authority to tell nobody to investigate anybody. Number one, you got to have elements. 
You got to, first, you got to have the facts that the facts that a crime has been committed, which I don't doubt. I understand. But but we just don't have the elements. We don't have nothing. I don't feel comfortable in in, in sending somebody to the attorney general say investigate him when I don't even know what's I don't I'm still in a fog. I, 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 the thing where I'm in a fog, this thing has been happening from six years old up until eleven years old, and nobody and I I think and I. I just don't know. I mean, I agree with you wholeheartedly. He, 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 he needs help. But I don't know what we can do as a commissioner. We can't empower nobody to arrest nobody. Uh, we, we, we can't do that. But we could, as a governing body, hearing one of our constituents ask, request uh, the Attorney General's office to at least look into it, send the SBI, which never got involved to begin with. And he did speak to the F SBI. When, when a lot of times... And, and you should know this from, from the past of injustices here in North Carolina. When, when there are groups that will not investigate things, other groups are brought in, either from the federal government or the state government, to do what local authorities will not do. And the local authorities may be wise to not do it, but we don't know as a people until we, we, we have a investigation, which to this point we've had none. I don't have a, and like I said before stated, I do not have a problem with being investigated, but I just don't feel comfortable, me, and I'd do anything in the world, brother, to help you if I could, but I don't feel comfortable asking somebody to investigate something that I don't know anything about. But this is, this is what you could do for him, since you're sitting up here as a commissioner. You, this, this could be something you could do, not, not to pass guilt on, or not to assess guilt, but to, to at least assess that there is a possible violation to this child and this family, and that an investigation should be merited. That's, that's what I've just what been I would asking do, for. What I would do today, just something. Kind. What I would do today for a constituent, I would advise you that you write the North Carolina Attorney General yourself and ask them. I mean, I find if, if an SBI didn't do anything, the district attorney, you work for the district attorney a year, all of that happened and nobody done anything, then let me tell you something. I'm not going to play with you, brother. If they couldn't do anything that ha that's empowered to do it, none of these jokers up here can do it. It's just a ploy. They're playing games. It's just a ploy. We, we need accountability. We need, and we need accountability. We all do. <laughs> and all and the thing about it is, I'm not going to sit here and tell you something that I don't know anything about. I'm not, let me ask you one question. Why are you here tonight? Who asked you to come? Look, at, nobody asked me to come. How did, how, how did you know we was meeting tonight? Um, because I <laughs> Bober to, County citizen. Well, well, how, did you, how did you know who was Dang. meeting tonight? I went to the Republicans meeting and spoke. Pardon me? I went to a Republicans meeting and spoke about what happened. And who told you that we was meeting tonight? Um, if you don't have to tell me, I, I'm not your attorney. I'm not an attorney, but I know where this is feeding from. And let me tell you, I, I feel your sympathy, and I do anything in the world I can to help you. But I am not. Gonna, I'm not going to vote tonight. To have somebody drugging something that I don't know anything about. I, I just right. can't do that. Mr. Chairman, I guess. Look, here's the long story on this. Did, uh, this came out in a police committee meeting. Unfortunately, that wasn't filmed to where the public can see the facts. Guess what? That's a serious matter with Hood Richardson. I'll, I'll go through what happened. Mr. Gray called me some seven or eight years ago. I've, I've and we've talked about this over and over and over again, and he's kept me up to date about what he was doing, and he wasn't getting anywhere with this. And then the police committee, he came to the police, he called me about the police committee, and he came to the police committee. But first he came to the, uh, the uh, Beaufort County Re Conservative Republican Club meeting, and I said, Bruce, what are you doing here? I and didn't. I didn't. I didn't know invite him. He 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 found out about the meeting and he came, and so that came to the police committee and that came here. Now, just because Hood Richardson's involved in it doesn't make it something that that's seedy or something that's dishonest or something that's rigged. If you want to save your soul on this, this board has information about a crime. We're as, we're guilty if we don't act on. It. And my motion is that we request as a board the North Carolina Attorney General to investigate this, and that's all we can do. 
I don't understand why anybody wouldn't want to find out the facts of why children are being abused. It's not just my child in this criminal organization. I will second that motion. Okay, we got a motion and we got a second. Uh, we have uh, Chief Charlie Rose that would love to speak. Is, is Chief Rose arguing this motion? Uh, I have a problem with this. Uh, I, he's coming up at the request of the chairman. He stood up, so well, but, I've got that privilege. But I understand that. But we've got a motion in front of the board, and I would I would want uh, Chief Rose to tell us whether he supports the motion or whether he's against it before he starts talking, because I see another political game going on here. Well, well, Mr. Rich, gentlemen, gentlemen. Chief Rose, at my request, at my request, this is the discussion. You are free to comment. Um, I am in agreement with Commissioner Richardson that the board ought to draft a letter to the Attorney General's office, to the District Attorney's office, to DSS, to any of the parties that are involved. So, and and beyond that, uh, you know, and to request that subpoenas be issued, affidavits be filled out, testimony be given by every person that's been involved since the investigation began over a decade ago. Bless you. you know, I will speak to the sheriff on it, and I will let him know to the best of my ability what was said. We will review what was said, and I will ask him to draft the same letter to the Attorney General. Mr. Chairman, that is, that is perfect. That's the perfect answer. I guess a, I've been a commissioner for seven years, and I have never seen us get in the, this situation. And I just, I just feel very uncomfortable. Uh, you know, you guys are talking, and you know what, what puts us in this position? I mean, what's going to change it if the attorney general is going to move forward on it? What, what, huh? Yes. I hate to do this, Chief, but I think I know why you, you, you think we should do it. You want us to do it to clean up and clear up your staff name. Is that correct? Or am I wrong? Or am I wrong? I'm the, talking to the Chief. There, there are because I, some of any those files that we have in any investigation that we have, there are limits to the amount of information that we can give, even to boards just like this that if the Attorney General's office or an investigation that was into investigations that are conducted by DSS, by any law enforcement agency, by the District Attorney's office, then th that office will have the access to everything that was done, everything that was said, everybody that was talked to, and could give reasons why something was done or was not done. You know, that, that you can ask questions of me all night, and there's some things that I can't just tell you about an investigation that could be covered. And some, you know, with something as egregious about what's being talked about tonight, there's no way me being who I am could just let that go without having some sort of discussion about what has happened and when it had happened. And I'm speaking from a person that I'm standing beside this person, and I've never spoken to him. I've never heard from him. I spoke to the sheriff about him. The sheriff, wouldn't he could walk up to the sheriff at Walmart and the sheriff would not know who he is. And this is something that's gone on for over a decade, but the two executive officers at the sheriff's office for the last almost seven years is reading about it in a file but not speaking to him. So that's, that's why I'm saying everything that I'm saying to you now. Mr. Chairman, in yes. answer to your question, you don't think this is something we should do? Well, in 21 years of being a commissioner, I've never heard of anything this egregious. So that's why it's before us, because we are this man's last resort. Charlie answered this perfectly as a good Christian man. All we need is an investigation. Without a sign, signing blame or guilt, an investigation is all we're requesting. Yes. Yes. Any other comment? Well, I think if the Attorney General picks this up and investigates, we're free. We have. We really don't even need to know a result. 
I mean, I, we don't need to have her, him come back in, you know, with a report or something like that. It's none of our business after that. It's the attorney general and the investigation. So I think that's the way we can get away from this thing is to write a letter to the attorney general explaining what's happened and see what happens, see where it goes. Perfect. Exactly. That's all we're asking for. Any other comments? Okay. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Those opposed. Wow. This is a miscarriage of justice on a grand scale. I will have comments on this at the end of the meeting. <laughs> sorry, Mr. Gray. You've got your investigation. I'm These sorry, sir. These morons didn't vote for it, but I can assure you the Attorney General will, do, will investigate. Right. Yeah, there again, I just don't understand why anybody wouldn't want to find out about children. Because they're political. Thank you. Very Thank you very much. All right. We're down to the border crisis, Commissioner Dethridge. Yeah, right now, right now on the border, and this is an ongoing problem we have. We have a southern border that's wide open, a northern border that's closed. They are trying to affect the browning of America. Their words... Their words, the words of the Democratic Socialists who want to change the demographics of voting in America for always and ever. In August, there was a, a record of over 200,000 illegal, illegal mig migrants coming across our border during the, one of the hottest periods of the year. The time of year when they never come, almost. 200,000 came because they've gotten a green light from the Biden-Harris administration to please come do our bidding. They're not being checked for COVID. Estimates are between 20 and 30 percent of COVID coming across the border. Once they get thrown in these cages, uh, they began as the Obama cages, then they became the Trump cages. Now they're the Biden-Harris cages. That, that, that COVID foments to a greater um, uh, 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 elevation. We're probably getting 40, 50 percent being sent out into America. Now, this hypocrisy is, all, is, is for all to see. It's too much, and we as commissioners are going to end up paying for it. So, and our constituents will foot the bill. So we have to be active now and care about it now. So I'm going to be talking about this every month, especially with 60,000 migrants now massing in uh, lower Central America to move up here as an invasion. 400,000? 400. 400? Thank you, sir. That's right. So this, this is happening. They're, they keep saying that the border is closed and nobody with a full working brain believes that. It is open and is open for a political future for, for, for Marxism. And this is their march and we are going to pay for it. And we need to be cognizant of it now. We need to know what their goals are and we need to be ready to do what we can do on the local level. I have a friend who thinks we should secede from the Union. Not only us, but, but every state that, that believes in uh, the Constitution. Against the states that don't believe in the Constitution. So, I mean, it's down to that at this point. All right, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, uh, before we go into closed session, we're going to go in the back conference room, so anybody who wants to stay here, you're welcome to stay. Katie, would you like to read us into closed session? Motion is, a motion is needed to go into closed session under NCGS 143-318-11A3 to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body in regards to Beaufort County versus Amerisource Bergen and to discuss information relating to a property tax issue. Need a motion to go into closed session. At a second. Second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Thank you. Oh, don't worry. They, they, they put themselves on the grill. They are on the grill. Thank you. There you go. All right. Need a, need a motion to come out of closed session. Is there a second? Second. All right. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Okay. Uh, David? need a motion uh, to approve uh, Lloyd's number uh, for the case. Uh, John? 
If you gentlemen don't mind, I'm going to give all four parcels real quick, just for record, and then I'm going to give it break it down real quick. Okay. So basically, it is four different read numbers. We're going to have read numbers 07945, 07946, 32358, and again, 32358, sorry, and then 17876. And really quickly, that comes up to a total of if you have them together, one seven one million seven hundred and ninety nine thousand six eighty four. I can break that down more individual if I need to, but that should be okay. Okay, motion to accept Lloyd's recommendation at one point eight million. I'll second the motion. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Thank you, Lloyd. No, I want my comment period. Motion to adjourn. No, I want my comment period. That's on the agenda. You, you, you guys close it out for me. Frankie, you might want to hear this because no, I, you're the one got, person that needs to hear this. I got other issues that I need to address. No, no, you don't. You got this. Is an important issue. The this board made a serious mistake tonight in not voting for the investigation, simply because. The Board of County Commissioners is the ultimate authority on a lot of issues in Beaufort County. We have commissioners that want to play serious politics and make the public believe things that are not true. Since I've been on this board, we have affected sheriffs, we have affected judges, we have affected the, the uh, U.S. government, we have affected district attorneys. There's only one board in the county that can take on issues like this that are not investigated. The public only has one place to appeal to, ultimately, when it is not done correctly. Now, the, what these people on this board that voted against this do not realize what they were elected to do, and that is to keep this county honest. There is no law against voting for the right thing under the right in, under any conditions. We are the ultimate authority when it comes to applying political pressure to get things done. And if you don't understand what your duties are, you need to resign. Moment to speak. I asked for that privilege, even though our chairman flew the coop. Uh, <clears throat> commissioners, you have a constitutional duty to observe and understand what the laws are of the land. And that one of those laws of the land is that the law will be applied equally. And I shouldn't have to tell all of you that. I shouldn't have to lecture you. But the, the very idea that, that in some way you're, you're, you may be helping the child when actually you are driving one thing home for that child, that her violation is okay. We're okay with it. We don't think anything should be done because we don't have any power. Yeah, you had power to write a simple letter to the Attorney General's office, even uh, Chief... Uh, uh, Rose thought it was a good idea. Of course they want absolution. Why wouldn't they? Everybody needs to be absolved of their guilt or not. And an investigation would find that out possibly. But I, I think what Randy said it best. Once that investigation goes to the Attorney General, it's out of our hands. We've done all we can do. There's not but so much we can do. And when Hood says we've, we've made a difference, he, those differences were made by very narrow margins. Am I right, Hood? And a lot of commissioners would not, would not have tried to do so, but he did. Now, this is another issue where we dropped the ball. And, and, and you should look into your heart as to why. This is not a political issue. This is a human rights issue. Motion to adjourn.